This is Pocket Watching with JT, the call-in financial talk show focused on helping you get your money right. Jason Thornton is a certified financial planner licensed in both tax and investments. Now, this is not personal financial advice. This is JT's real reaction to all your money and business questions. Are you deep in debt, living paycheck to paycheck, and looking for a way out? Call Pocket Watching with JT, the financial advisor for the people. Need more? Book your personal consultation with my man JT at pocketwatcher.net. Now, let's go pocket watching. Hey, Pocket Watchers, welcome to Pocket Watching with JT. I am certified financial planner Jason Thornton. I am a real financial advisor that specializes in tax and wealth planning for my clients. But on YouTube, I react to your money questions and scammer news. Got to give a big shout out to the Pocket Watchers. We are over 10 million views in total and almost 100 thousand subscribers and we're a little over two years old with this youtube channel so i just want to give a shout out to you guys i appreciate the support as you make your way into the live stream make sure you hit that like button share this content subscribe if you have not already all right we're gonna get straight into it what are we talking about tonight what are we talking about tonight right here this is it I'm asking you guys this question. Are NFTs a scam? Okay. In a little bit, there will be a link pinned in the live chat. You can hit that link, come up, and, and, and let's have a conversation, right? Let's, let, let's talk because maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. But I want to be very clear. Pocket watching with JT, I am not new to this conversation. There's a lot of people who are talking about the failure of NFTs now. I was talking about it a long time ago. I did this video a long time ago where in this video, I openly say, and I tell you, your NFT is worthless. That is the title of the video. The title of the video is Your NFT is Worthless. I said this a long time ago. But okay. All right. Some of you did not want to hear that from the pocket watcher, but now all of a sudden everyone wants to talk about how your NFT is worthless. So it it hit the mainstream because recently a research report came out that said that about 95 percent 95 percent of all of the nfts are worthless and of those that still have some worth they're around like five dollars some are twenty thirty dollars a rare few are still a few thousand dollars, but they plummeted. I mean, dropped in value. Like, it's it's ridiculous. It's actually sad. The way that money just disappeared. One day, you had something that was supposed to be worth a lot of money. Then the next day, nothing. Absolutely nothing. But some of you, some of you may have some uh maybe bad memories. So let's let's see what NFTs were. In the internet. They're called NFTs. They're now selling for huge bucks. $69 million. Oh so what's behind this latest craze? What the f is an NFT, bro? <laughs> if I'm really outside, <laughs> but it's just a d swinging contest. And like, look, I bought a picture of a monkey. The idea of an NFT, I guess, is like art or something. But none of the examples that I've seen is like beautiful art. Yeah. It's a f monkey in a Supreme hoodie. <laughs> what exactly is an NFT? NFT stands for non-fungible token. 
Essentially a digital signature backed by blockchain technology that proves ownership of something. Unlike Bitcoin, which are all identical by design, NFTs are unique. To some degree, what NFTs offer for sale is the idea of scarcity. As a rule of thumb, culture is governed by trends. Whether it's fashion, food, art, or anything in between, our human instinct is to try to align ourselves with what's trending and see if it's for us. And sure enough, hip hop is no different. Since the world of crypto, NFTs, and the metaverse suddenly became a hot button issue last year, rappers have sought to hop on the wave in every conceivable way. From becoming avid collectors to producing their own lines that offer all manner of incentives to their fans, the lucrative world of NFTs has plenty of rappers looking to get a piece of the pie. It's scammy. People were saying to me, Ross, drop an NFT, you can make grants. But then I thought about it and I was like, but I'd be selling worthless to my supporters. The people that put me in this position, the people whose eyeballs and clicks and views and time watched, their time invested in me, pays my bills. To me, that's just an unforgivable sin. I see a lot of these rappers dropping these NFTs and I'm just like, you lot are scamming your fans. You don't respect your fans. Stop asking me to do NFTs. I'm not finna co-sign. Kanye West recently wrote on Instagram. For now, I'm not on that wave. I make music and products in the real world. But while Ye didn't explicitly say no and simply seemed unmoved by the concept, most of today's major rappers have no problem attaching their names to NFTs. You remember Bored Apes and how when they were developed as like one of the preeminent NFT investment vehicles, some of the most obnoxious cringy men on the internet assured you that they had taste and they had financial foresight to purchase these JPEGs that were gonna be major money makers. And if you don't have the taste or the money, then you're just a loser. If you haven't seen them in a while, this is what they look like. This is the thing that you should pay tens of thousands of dollars to own, this art. Anyway, it's been a little bit since they were developed. And hey, what do you know? Not necessarily the great financial investment that they were pitched to be. ApeCoin, the currency of Bored Apes maker Yuga Labs Virtual World, has tanked in value, losing 93% of its market cap by last year. Last week, by the way, CNBC reported that singer Justin Bieber's Bored Ape, once valued at $1.3 million all of a year ago, is now worth about $60,000. The uh, board ape that Steph, uh, Steph Curry owns, that has dropped to under a third of its original $180,000 value. And I don't know how much exactly Paris Hilton and Madonna's board apes have dropped in value, but I do know that they're, they filed a class action lawsuit against the company because they feel that they've been defrauded. Not only by the board apes manufacturer, but particularly by other celebrities who have promoted the NFT without saying that they're being financially compensated by the company, which I just want to um, forewarn our audience. If you see an influencer tweeting or posting on Instagram about an NFT or cryptocurrency, you had better believe they're being paid for that. All right, now I wanna be clear. Yes, I told you guys a long time ago that your NFT is worthless. But when I actually see everyday normal people throw thousands of dollars, maybe even their life savings into something this silly, it makes me start to think, right? It leads me to ask the question, why? Why would an average person believe that throwing money at some JPEG would make them some sort of multimillionaire. Then I remember that most of us, I'm not, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking about all of us. Most of us are sheep. We follow celebrities. We follow influencers. And when they say to do something, we do it. I don't know why. I don't know what part of our brain totally disconnects from logic. But when someone that we like, someone that we see on TV screens, it doesn't matter if they sing, if they dance, if they act, or if they play a sport. If we look up to them as some kind of celebrity, when they tell us to do something, we jump. Because last time I checked, I don't know anyone who is now a multimillionaire because they sold Tory Lane's NFT, right? 
They bought Tory Lane's NFT, but I don't think that they resold it for millions or thousands of dollars. I don't even believe that Tory Lane's, who's currently in prison right now, I don't believe Tory Lane's even understood what he was selling to his fans. I think his main concern was getting money for himself. And if you happen to get some money afterwards, okay. But we see where he's at. So next issue. Now, my mind also, I, I, I like to ask questions. And when I see average everyday people losing real dollars over internet pictures, I say, why, why isn't there some kind of government agency that would step in and protect investors? Couldn't there be some kind of, I don't know, regulatory body that would step in for the little guy, the little investor, and protect them from themselves, right? Why, why couldn't the government come up with a group of people who had the mission to protect small investors from scammy type of investments? Well, then I thought to myself, there is. And last time I checked, a lot of you guys don't like them. And that is the SEC. See, the SEC is the regulatory body that is missioned to protect the small investors. That's what they do. But if you watch a lot of the pro-financial literacy videos out there on the internet, they will say that those rules actually hurt you. Because here's one of the things. I don't care if Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, Tory Lanez, I don't care if they lose money on NFTs because they have enough money to rebound. You don't. Well, see, the SEC does have rules about speculative and risky investments like this. Normally, risky junk like this should only be promoted to what's referred to as an accredited investor. See, an accredited investor is someone that has a net worth of about $1 million. This is excluding your personal home. Or you have an annual income of about $200,000 annually if you're single or $300,000 annually if you are married. See, the government believes these type of people can rebound if they throw their money at something stupid like a bored ape. The average everyday person probably cannot. But the problem is, you guys don't want the regulation because I saw it. I, I I see you on my timeline. You're, you're all excited about the blockchain and cryptocurrency and how it's, it's decentralized finance. So you don't have big brother government stepping in. But if you lost your life savings on a digital picture of a monkey, I bet you wish the SEC and the government would have stepped in to help. You can't have it both ways. Either you want regulation to help weed out the scamminess, or you want the wild, wild west where your grandma loses her home because she bought a picture of a monkey. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. So I want to hear from you guys. Uh, in the chat, there is a link. You hit that link. You can call in. We can have a conversation. Maybe you can let me know something that I'm missing here. But I told you guys a long time ago that your NFT is most likely worthless. It means nothing. I'm old enough to remember a few things. Number one, I remember when comic books blew up. Now, see, I'm a nerd. I like comic books before comic books were on the big screen. I like comic books before the average person thought comic books 
was cool. But there was a craze around the 90s when normal people who don't normally buy comic books, they started to buy comic books because they thought if they buy a comic book today, maybe they'll have like Superman number one, which is worth millions of dollars. And what did the comic book industry do when they saw there was a lot of suckers looking to buy comic books as an investment? Well, the comic book industry started flooding the market with a bunch of new number one print comic books. Millions and millions of copies of these new number one print comic books. But of course, there's no one sitting around today with a multi-million dollar copy of a 1996 comic book because the market was flooded. It, if you're not buying it for the actual value of it yourself, like if you're trying to buy it as an investment thinking that you're going to flip it on someone else, guess what? You're not that smart. But let's be real. And I'm not either. If you're doing it, other people are doing it too. The reason why Superman number one is so valuable is because when it first came out, it wasn't special. Many of the people who bought Superman number one probably ended up throwing it away a few months later. So when time goes by and the Superman brand and comic is so big, the very few people who still have the original copy, that's valuable. NFTs will probably never be that valuable. It, it, it is what it is, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to start bringing you guys up. We can have a conversation. So I got Mel, I got Def, I got Futu, I got the lead investor. I'm going to start bringing you guys up. Don't worry about camming up because no one will see you. It's only an audio call. So let me bring up to the stage Mel. Let me bring you up. Mel, you are live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's hey, going on? Hey, JT. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for calling. All right. So I'm offended by the comic books because I bought some at 10. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I ain't know about it. We didn't have JT back then. I wasn't watching YouTube. No, hold but on. Did you, did you buy the comic book because you liked it? Or were you buying it because you thought it was going to be worth a whole lot more in 10 years? Okay, at that age, yes, because I kind of heard the uh, pandemonium, and it was See, only like 10 people, cents. people, people forget it was everybody was buying new comic books. I didn't everybody know all of that. It yeah, was be this huge thing. But go ahead. Yeah, it was only ten cents, so I think <laughs> I'm I'm good. All right, I read them, so I'm good. I got a little education from it. Okay. All right. Two words I want to say: tulip mania. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, but please t tell the story because I, I most people when you tell this story. Uh -huh. Most people will not believe yes. because it sounds so ridiculous. Yes. Go ahead. My dad was kind of like your dad. He's like mm -hmm. a very safe Warren Buffett investor. Mm -hmm. Worked hard on the railroad for years. Made pretty decent living. It was eight of us. We begged for nothing. Good man. Mm -hmm. But he was always sure to teach us about safety and finances. So I went to him one day. I was like, Dad, you ever, what you think about this Bitcoin stuff? Because I'm on the fence. I'm not like really sold on it. He was like, I haven't invested in it because I don't know what it is. So I said, let's just watch some YouTube videos together. It led us down this wormhole until I think Warren Buffett was like giving it the business. Like I wouldn't give it if I wouldn't take it even if it was free. <laughs> and it went into this wormhole where we looked up tulip mania. I was like, mm -hmm. you ever heard of that? And my dad, I always think he knows everything. I was like, you never heard of tulip mania? Let's watch it together. So we sat down and watched tulip mania. Uh -huh. Now you could correct me in between uh, JT, JT because mm -hmm. the story went like back then somewhere in Europe, I want to say Dutch, mm -hmm. back maybe in the 17, 1800s per se, um, these uh, explorers were going out and they found and discovered some tulips. So they brought them back. Mm -hmm. So since they were rare in that part of Europe, people were just like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I really want one. So it basically became to represent a token of money because people would give them money to go when they go explore, which sometimes was months and say, you know what, buy a couple for me. 
And then the red ones became more expensive than the white ones and the yellow ones. And so, for example, if I know overseas that I sent him to get $50 worth of tulips and I want to go get my hair done, I can say, boo, here go two tulips. When he get back, you're going to get two tulips, like physical tulips. It came to a point where they just had so many uh, uh, enough and they kind of spread and the value grew and grew and grew. Mm -hmm. that it just did this deep drop. <laughs> so when it came down to like this whole Bitcoin business, I, first of all, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of like celebrities. Good mm -hmm. for you, but you're not going to influence me. I take common sense plus common sense. And then it equals Melissa's bank account. That's how that works. And what the knowledge my dad gave me, no offense to some people that go on it. I think as far as a short run, there are people, people that are good at telling like oh you know it's going to go up at this point or whatever like that and mm -hmm. it's good for like a quick investment like flip it and sell it but i would never sit here and retire my money and get my life savings on it i'm gonna say that too the whole thing with oh the government has no control listen that's called laws they mm -hmm. could do and make up any law any day of the week that they want Later on down the line. That's just how I feel. I don't right. I don't feel like nothing's off the table with things. I mean, there's some things we thought they couldn't have control of and they find a way to weasel some type of ways in. That's just my standpoint. I like to hear yours, but tulip mania. Those yeah. that are NFTs, look up tulip mania. No, that, that that's a great point. And Mel, thank you so much for calling in. I appreciate it. And yeah, tulip mania, I mean, it comes from the concept of if you think there is scarcity, okay, great. But then later you find out, it, it, I mean, it's just a flower. It's a flower. A tulip is a flower. <laughs> a tulip is a flower, right? It, it, it may be rare where you are, but there's so many. And you can always plant the flower. And the mania went crazy to the point where the value was so sky high, it was a bubble. Like, I can't believe anyone really thought that a tulip had that much in value and then it came crashing down. The people who were selling it made money. The people who were holding on to them lost money. And I think that's what we're seeing with a lot of these bad crypto coins and NFTs. But I mean, personally, I mean, the concept of manufactured scarcity is digital, but with the code, I'm going to make it... <laughs> I'm going to make it scarce. And then when you find out that there's people who dig into the code and when they want to, they change it. Like code is supposed to be the law until something bad happens and then they change the code. So it's to me, it's BS. I, I mean, I, I can't I, I can never see it as a legitimate investment where someone is going to put anything more than three to five percent of their total portfolio in it. It it, it 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 makes no sense. But let me bring up the lead investor. We got the lead investor in the building. What's going on? I I, I can see you, but it sounds like you, you you're muted. You might be muted. Try that. Yeah, I'm I'm I was muted. How you doing, JT? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for calling in. Oh man, this is a good topic. So I got it. I um for some of my older folks, um or some of my younger folks. You remember the expression "boo boo the fool." Oh, absolutely! It's that is a uh, a black mother's favorite saying. I'm not boo boo the fool. Absolutely. And so I think that's what we're dealing with. And I, I'm not trying to call people fools. I don't want to do that. I don't want to offend people. But it's something you said that was so. I mean, 100 percent correct. You said a lot of these other stars and these people they can invest in some of these things because they can rebound. And with us as black people. We have such thin margin. We don't have a lot of disposable income. That's why I'm so surprised why some of us are jumping on the bandwagons with these type of types of investments. Now, I got a question for you real quick, JT. If you weren't a certified financial planner, would you, I mean, the way you think about money, just real quick, because I, I want to see something. The way you think about money, is it because of your education or were you this way prior to your education? I was built like this. I'm not a normal person. Let yeah. me be the first one. That, right. that I was built like this. My father gotcha. manufactured me in a lab, right? I was literally his bookkeeper at the age of nine. 
I would sit by his desk, like he had, you know, his office, his desk, and I would sit by him while he allowed person after person after person to come into his office and pitch him some ridiculous investment or ask him for money or whatever. And I would just sit there and watch him tear them apart about why he would never give them money, why the investment is bad. I mean, if my father still to this day, if my father gets 10 calls in one day, nine and a half of those calls are for someone asking him for money. So I was manufactured oh, wow. in a lab when it comes to smelling out BS, hearing all the sob stories. I've seen most of the hustles, most of the scams. So even if I didn't grow up to be a financial advisor, I would still be like this. But once again, I acknowledge that's not the normal way a child is raised. And 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 that's what I someone told me the same thing. They said you built different. I said, you know what made me this way when it comes about money investment? It was poverty. So I'm not saying poverty is a good thing, but what happened was I learned, and that's what I'm telling people. I said, if you've been impoverished all your life, sometimes it's just better to do nothing. And that's what I'm telling you. If you don't understand these investments, just do nothing. I, I, I said, think about, uh, think about our ancestors. A lot of them, they just used to put money in the mattress. And people's like, yeah, but it made no interest. But you know what? They didn't lose a lot either. And they had homes. They had, they had, they had things they left to, to some of us. I mean, and, and so I'm, that's just where I'm at with some of this, like the NFT thing. I just, I, I never got it, JT. I just, I don't understand it. I get, I, I was, I was cracking up when you said you had a, a picture of a monkey <laughs> with a, a hoodie on. I said, why would you buy that? But I think, you know what I think sometimes with some of this, some of these investments, I think we're too early on them. And I think some of them, not necessarily NFTs, but some of them maybe in the future and in, in maybe when they, when the construct of it is different, it possibly mm -hmm. might be a viable option just for a speculative play. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make right. it like my retirement right. plan, but just a speculative play. That's what mm -hmm. I think. But I think sometimes people say, well, you got to get in early because that's where you get the money. And so I understand that, but it's just, man, it's just, when I saw this pop up, when you say you're going to talk about NFT as a, I said, oh, boy, this should be a good one. So as usual, man, thank you so much. I appreciate your content. Look forward to listening to the rest of what you got for tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to be clear. There are certain investment opportunities where, yes, if you can get in early, it's going to the moon, you're 100x your money. But they're so rare. Like, they're so ridiculously rare the average person is not in a financial position to even be able to capitalize on that because you have to understand this. You have to invest in, let's say, 50 or 100 startups and maybe one of them blow up. And that one blowing up makes back all the money that you lost on the other 99 and puts a nice, nice hefty return in your pocket. The average person does not have the money to lose on 99 investment opportunities and then one blow up. That's why the SEC has the rules of accredited investors. You can complain all you want, but it's actually a protection for the average everyday person. But let's get through these calls. We got uh, Def Dabster in the building. What's going on, man? What's up, JT? Thanks for calling in. What's going on? Man, bro, I've been wanting to talk to you for the longest, just so you know. I've been a pocket watcher with you for a minute, man. Me and my son, bro, this is hilarious. You know how you got the internet on the TV? Right. right. When you do lives, we put it on the TV like it's a movie. <laughs> 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 Neighbors walking by, they can hear it. We be blasting it like it's the cuts, bro. You provide us with great enter entertainment. <laughs> I'm, well, it, I'm, I'm serious too, but it's funny, right? And you give us a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Like watching you, because I, I want to actually get a consultation with you, mm -hmm. but you give me so much game. I'm just like, he's giving me the consultation right now. I started off with the MLMs, right? Because oh. I, 
I hate MLMs. I, I just love content on mm -hmm. things going against them. Somehow I came up on you. I'll be mm -hmm. seeing all the white guys. I said, oh, a brother, a real <laughs> one too. Fell in love with it. I've been waiting on you to talk about these NFTs. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, JT. Mm -hmm. What's an NFT? A non-fungible token. It's some digital code that can show that there, it's unique versus other digital code. But at the end of the day, it's not technically the asset that's tied to the digital code. I'm told, and once again, I'm not the super tech guy, but I'm told that the NFT is basically the receipt that shows ownership, but within itself, it's not the actual asset. That's what I'm told. Exactly. And, and the thing is, is that, okay, I'm a reseller. Mm -hmm. right i resell clothes and all all that type of stuff what mm -hmm. i've taught my son is that this is worth what somebody will give you <laughs> you could say whatever all day we could put whatever price tag on it right or mm -hmm. even if we actually did buy it for that let's say i bought it for a thousand dollars i come to pocket watcher and say mm -hmm. i want a thousand dollars you all like but it ain't worth a thousand dollars Right. So if I can't get nobody to give me a thousand dollars for it, how could it be worth that? Now, what what's always amazed me, JT, mm -hmm. is how these NFTs have these ill price tags, <laughs> kind of like the Tulsa real estate fund, how the shares. <laughs> Just a made up number. Just a, Just a made up number. <laughs> so to me, that's a scam. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Am, am I correct or am no, I no, off? You're, no, you're on it. So let me give you an example. There are certain rules and regulations when it comes to like the stock market, right? Let's say for whatever reason, I start up a C corporation with a million shares and I find one dummy who's willing to buy one share for a thousand dollars well then logic would try to dictate that okay well he sold one share of this new corporation for a thousand dollars so now that gives my entire business this ridiculous evaluation because i have to now assume that the other one million minus one right nine hundred thousand nine hundred nine nine whatever is all worth a thousand dollars each as well right now you can't really do that because there's rules and regulations that say no you can't simply just try to give your entire business an evaluation based off a few dummies that you were able to get to buy at a certain price because in reality if you dump it on the marketplace the average person will not buy it at that price i feel like that's what they're trying to do when it comes to NFTs, like with Tory Lanez, like if y'all go down the rabbit hole of Tory Lanez and his NFT project, the guy, he, he truly did not understand what he was doing, right? Mm -mm. He sold his NFT. Then he saw people listing the NFT in the secondary market online for like $30,000 or $40,000. He's jumping up and down and like, oh my God, they're selling it for 30. It's like no one bought it. No. <laughs> at that come price. on, JT. Talk that to was these the listed friends. price. No one actually <laughs> bought it at that price. It does not matter what sticker you put on a product and say, okay, this is worth it. No, it's what people actually buy it for. That's the reason why when you buy a car and you drive off, that means you can buy a car today. And that car can be worth $80,000. And then you drive off the lot. If you immediately want to turn around and sell the car to someone else and they say, I'll give you 55 for it. That's what it's worth. Because that's what they're going to buy it for. Come that on. The appreciation that happens the second you pull off the lot. That is what a lot of people are now experiencing in the housing market. People who recently bought a home within the last two or three years, they're seeing that they cannot resell it for more. They're actually seeing that they're reselling it for either the same and in some cases less. That's what it is. But mm -hmm. that's, that's a great point, bro. That's a great point.
Hey, man, I know you got a bunch of people waiting to get on, bro. I'm about to tap out. I'm going to call back in. In your chat, I'm the dude, Def Chef. My brother, thank you so much. Thanks for being a pocket watcher for so long. You and you and the son, thank you, and I appreciate it. All right, we're going to go through these calls because I'm not going to keep you all night. I got Patrick. I got Bobby. I got Ace, Chris, Keith, Marcus. I'm going to get you guys all on. So let me bring up Patrick. You're live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on? Patrick? Going once. Going twice. I see you in the car. You're doing something. I'll bring you back later. Let me bring up Bobby. Bobby, be ready. Bobby, you're live on the air. What's going on? What's up, JT? Thanks for letting me on. Been a Pocket Watcher for like two years. Oh, man. Right. you That's almost day one, two years. You day one. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I remember when you had under 5,000 subscribers. I was working on my moving company, driving to California. <laughs> so I've been, it, you've been preaching everything that should be said. And uh, I have to say, it's like, if it's not NFTs, it's going to be another, it's going to be another thing. Yeah. But it, all it is, is just a lottery ticket. Mm hmm and this time, though, you're not giving half to the government. You're giving half to the scammer. Because <laughs> there's got to be that one person. Like when I found out. So when I first heard about NFTs, it was that one big sale from the guy named Beeples or whatever, where he had like 5,000 or whatever it was, a collection of all his art. Now, number one, the guy's art. Now, if, if the guy sees this, hey, there's no shot at you. But I'm not a fan of your art, period, right? It's like your art is what it is, but I don't think it's worth that. But it's sold for some ridiculous amount of money, like 60 million, like something ridiculous. And people sold it. And, and, and that's when NFTs hit the mainstream and every news uh, outlet was talking about the NFTs because you had this guy who made some digital art. He put it together, like all these different unique pictures he put them all together and sold it and it sold for like 40 million 60 million something ridiculous come to find out the person who bought it knew him the person who bought it technically he was doing business with i feel like it was all a scam like you ever see three card monty now this is real old but three card monty is a game where you got three uh playing cards there's probably something underneath one or at least one of the cards is red and the other two are black and you're moving the cards around and it looks real simple and you see a guy win, right? They moving the cards, boom, 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 boom. You see a guy win, he wins 30 bucks or hundred bucks and he walks off. Then you step up, you see him move the cards, boom, 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 boom. You try to point out which card is the right card, which card is the red card, but you keep losing, right? What you didn't know is the first guy that you saw win, he was the partner of the hustler. He only won to bring in other victims. And I feel personally like Beeples and all the other people who made a lot of money in NFTs, they were in on it. They were the ones that all the victims were supposed to see and picture themselves as so that they can jump in and they got got. But I could, I, I, I could be wrong. What do yeah. you think? Uh, it's, it's exactly the same. Now, I've been keeping up on the crypto for two years mm -hmm. and – I could see it with like you got an NFT with the purchase of like a Jordan. That that's fine. That kind of makes sense. But a lot of it was just buy this and it's going to shoot to the moon. I was like, and I have a lot of employees that work for me. They all bought into this during the pandemic. I'm watching them talk about NFTs, and now we're in 2023, and it's like, hey, can I get a cash advance? Hey, can I get this? Hey, I'm a little short on money. It's like, well, what happened? Because like you were making the last three years was a really big boom for moving. You, you guys were making like I was signing checks for like twenty five hundred dollars to mm -hmm. these guys. And it's like, what'd you spend all this money on? And it's like, you bought that. You, you w w like, all right. And it's like, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get off the nine to five. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know what happened when I grew up. We all knew that not all of us are Rockefeller. You got it's going to be a slow, arduous grind. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something because I had a hard fall for my first business. Mm -hmm. It's a slow step up to that success. But when you fall, it's like you're falling with no parachute straight down that elevator shaft from the 90th floor. So, 
just be careful. I've learned my lesson. I came back. I'm just a little bit more smart with what I'm doing. And I make sure I have reserve cash to do it. And I'm not trying to borrow all this money because I've seen, I have so many banks that call in that people want to borrow money to put it into investments. And you got to be careful with those brokerages because they're just predators on you guys. So but that's Thank all you. I got to say. It's a lot of finance, like 90% of it is a scam. 10% of it is truth. But you got to find someone who's actually going to tell you the truth. Yeah. yeah. And JT's one of them. So thank you. <laughs> hey, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, people, listen, I'm I'm rooting for you. I want you to be wealthy. I'm not here trying to say everything's a scam. Well, you know, that, you know, you don't do anything like no, no, no. And I get some pushback from this. So I want to be clear. I'm going I'm to keep bringing up callers. But let me say something real quick. A lot of times some people come on the channel and they'll, you know, put it in the uh, comments. They'll say, well, JT, all you do is make videos about scammers. You tell us what not to do. When are you ever going to recommend someone? When are you ever going to tell us what we need to invest our money in? Now, that's not the type of channel that I do. This is not the uh, podcast channel, the, the hip hop finance podcast channel where I interview a lot of successful black business owners. There's many other channels on YouTube that do that. If that's what y'all want to see, go watch that. Y'all can come back for me when y'all want to see me make fun of scammers. And, but if you want to watch very successful black uh, entrepreneurs, go watch them and then come back over here when you're done. Uh, but today, right now, I'm going to actually give you a recommendation. All right, real quick. Before you open up your wallet and you spend any money on any investment, I do not care if it's the stock market or if it is real estate or if it's cryptocurrency. I don't care what it is. Before you make an investment outside of yourself, you have to ask yourself the question, have I made the investment in me first? This is what I mean. The thing that's probably going to make you wealthy, if you ever become wealthy, the thing that's probably going to make you wealthy is your own personal earning potential. The money that you make on your job or the money that you make on your small business, whatever it is, that's most likely the thing that's going to make you wealthy because the money that you make on your high earning job or the money that you make in your successful small business. You're going to take that money and that's the money you're going to invest. But have you invested in you first? Have you applied yourself and see, hey, maybe there's some sort of trade school I can go to so I can make more money. Maybe I can go to a junior college and take some courses. Or maybe I can go to a four-year institution. Whatever it is. Or maybe I can take the time at an entry level position or get some kind of apprenticeship, whatever it is, have you invested in you before you look for other things to invest in, invest in yourself. That is the one and only recommendation that I'm probably going to tell you where to put your money other than the traditional stuff that I normally tell people after you have a budget and you've paid down your debt, you need to be investing 15 to 20% of your income in traditional asset classes. If you have a 401k at your job, you probably need to do that. If you don't have that, open up a IRA and fully fund that. Traditional stuff. Should you invest in single stocks? Normally I say no. You probably just need to take the returns of an index fund. But if you're looking for recommendations, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not what I do. All right, let me bring up, I got Ace, I got Chris, Keith, and Marcus. Let me bring up Ace. Ace, you're live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on? Yes, hello. How, how are you, uh, JT? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for calling. All right. First of all, I've been a long-time watcher, first-time caller. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm from Canada, and I'm sure everybody saw it in the news. I'm sorry for what happened last week. I have to tell you, you I really like what you do, and you're a positive image for the community. Oh, I don't I don't get that a whole lot, but thank you. I appreciate it. So what I want to say is that I don't think most people know what an NFT is. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Technically, everybody has an, interacted with an NFT and are in a position of an NFT. Mm-hmm. An NFT is basically what you have in your wallet. I mean, a driver's license, a points card. And if you have a career, then whatever your career gives you for identification or signature, those are NFTs. Mm-hmm. Now, now that you know that, would you sell those things? And if you would, how much would you be able to fetch for those? <laughs> Would you like, would you sell your ID? Would you sell those things? I mean, most people don't want them other than exactly. for fraud. So no. Exactly. So people thought that, you know, they could make like a million dollar by buying monkeys online. Well, this is what you get, it's, you know? So anyway, I don't want to hold back the line. I had to go back to the XRP proper party. <laughs> like, uh, really love your show. I'm always there watching. Shout out to you, man. Uh, hey. I gotta go. So. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna hold the line. Enjoy. Have a good weekend. I love you, you too, man. You, I, you rock. I, I appreciate you, my neighbor to the north in Canada. Thank you so much for rocking with Pocket Watching with JT. All right, here we go. We got Chris, Keith, and Marcus. Let me bring up Chris. You're live on the air. What's going on? Hey, Keith. Hey, Keith. Can you hear me? Yeah, and you're a little far away. So you know, if you got like a Bluetooth or something, you want to make sure you got your phone right up to you. But go right ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, man, I love your show because you're petty, <laughs> but you're educated with it. So, <laughs> and hey, and that's I'm studying to be a uh, registered financial advisor. So, that's when you bring up. out this stuff, I'm like, this is on point. <laughs> and I've been telling people for years how all of these new schemes, like I was a part of the whole BitConnect thing when it came out. Lost money with that. Yeah. Uh, I was doing the game. I was doing the game. Mm. So when I see all these other little uh, Ponzi schemes and scams come out, I'm like, man, and people just go crazy over it. I'm just like, man, these people just don't know how dangerous this stuff is. And this right. is why you got people getting scammed out of their money by a DJ Envy, a Caesar, and all of these other people. And I'm just like, hey. When black people gonna learn. And, well, I mean, but anyway, that, 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 that's a good question. That's a good question. But let me say this: a lot of this comes with maturity. Okay, a lot of right. it comes with maturity. When you are young and you're excited and you think you know it all, it is what it is. We've all been 25. If you're over 25, we've all been 25. And right. When you're young and you're like, I got this, you think you got the world mapped out and you know everything, uh, you, you you can be somewhat naive. And right. like you were a part of BitConnect. You were in BitConnect. So you'll probably never be scammed by something like that again because you saw it, you experienced it. A lot of these right. guys have not experienced the scam yet. So... Right. You know, they just don't see it. And when it comes to our culture, our community, a lot of our community is youth driven. I think that's a problem. There's a place for youth, but the youth should not be driving the culture in a way where it's not checked by elders that's going to help them understand, hey, you know, we've been down that path before it doesn't work out. I think that's probably why we see a lot of issues because we have a very uh, youth driven culture where they'll tell you, you over 40 years old, you shouldn't even be rapping. Now, hold on. Let, 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 I said that too quick. <laughs> let me be clear. If you're over 45 years old trying to start a rap career, that's probably not what it should be. But if you are an established rapper and you just happen to turn 45, it does not mean we put you on the shelf and be like, you're done. You can continue to create your art, your music and whatever until you die. I feel like we have a culture where it's like, if you're not young, it's over for you unless you're like a traditional professional. Oh, okay, you can be an old accountant. You can be an old lawyer, but you can't be an old influencer who's driving culture because for us, it's supposed to be driven by the youth. Who have the energy, they don't have the experience. I think that's the problem. I agree. No, I was just going back to say, like you said, man, uh, making a mistake, being naive, you know, they helped me a lot. 
And I went and actually paid and got a mentor to learn how to invest, how to look at things, how to look for scams, you know, and stuff like that. And I, I will say this. Hold on. I will say this. Yeah. <laughs> if, you pay, if you pay for a mentor, they want a mentor. They were a consultant. Right. You paid for a consultant, which is cool. I'm listen. I pay for consultants right. all the time. But there's a big right. difference between a mentor and a consultant. Okay. Consultants you. you pay. Mentors are right. someone in your life who's willing to share their wisdom for the love of the game because they 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 want to see the 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 growth of their profession. So there's there, there's a difference. Okay, I got you. I agree with that. I agree with that. But it's just you know the just the you know the the need to educate yourself. Like you said, it talked about index funds. It's risky buying a single stock, and yep. the index fund is more safe. But people need to learn how to, you know, learn how to uh, basically pick up on things like that. I mean, reading is, you know, is 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 free. You know, get a book. If you have to get an ebook, you know, it, it's not hard. But we have to start looking at things like that. And you know, we can't blame. We can't always blame the scammer. What they say, fool me once, blame on you. Fool me twice. I can't get the blame on you again. Third time, that's on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we just got to learn. We got to learn, man. That's it. That's it. The whole NFT thing was, just, it was an easy scam right out the gate. Easy scam right out the gate. But that's yeah, it, though, man. brother. I appreciate you, man. I'm Wall Street Lodge. on Instagram. I, I follow you, big fan. And I'm going to keep putting you on and sharing your, sharing your information with all the people. I appreciate it, Chris, man. You have a great night, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling in. All right, we're going to wrap this thing up. We got a couple more callers. We got Keith and Marcus. Let me bring up Keith. Keith, you're live on the air. What's going on, man? Hey, JT. Uh, I appreciate what you do. I'm a local St. Louis. And so oh, that's what's you know, up. Here, I love the support. So <laughs> here's the issue I've had with cryptocurrency and mm -hmm. NFTs from Jump, right? And it's, it's a simple... Uh, uh, a theory that, you know, I guess a lot of people won't, you know, I just aren't getting with it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's backed by nothing. It's like a fiat currency on steroids, <laughs> right? You know, and I'm an accountant. So, you know, a lot of my friends and family are sometimes run financial ideas past me, you know, and mm -hmm. crypto came on my radar years ago, right? Before it became what it is now, you know, it seemed like a lot of people were just using it to do black market deals on the internet, you know, and, uh, you know, it's become an investment vehicle. I don't know how, but it's backed by nothing. You know, uh, for those who don't know, a fiat currency is a currency that's not backed by a commodity like gold, silver. You can't run to the treasury with your $1 and demand $1 of gold anymore. We're not on the gold standard anymore. All right. right? So when you have something like crypto, that's backed by nothing. It's 100% speculative, you know, and yeah. NFTs, if, if I go buy a painting from so a Sotheby's auction, it's been appraised. It's probably backed by an insurance policy by Sotheby's or whatever company they may contract. It mm -hmm. has something backing it. You know, right. when you have people out here investing their money in something backed by nothing, just either a uh, code in somebody's hard drive or <laughs> A, a, a photo, you know, that somebody made in Photoshop an hour. That's always been a scary idea to me, you know, and I just cannot understand why so many people, mm. you know, just have put the money, their life savings, like you said earlier, into yeah. this with the hopes of getting rich. To be honest, you know, from the beginning, my wife years ago came to me and said, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, this is this is a money dump. You, you're going to lose all your money. We're not putting a dollar into it. We're not putting a dime. Put your money back in your pocket. We're better off going on vacation, you know? So that's all I had to say. I appreciate your time, JT. I know you're trying to move the show along, but that's just a message I want people to hear. Go research fiat currency, what that is. Understand that these things are backed by nothing but speculation. And when you do that, you're destined to lose. God bless. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. It's, it's like it's like collectibles, right? It's it, it's 
collectibles have a, a have a value to a particular set of people. And if you are outside of the club, you don't see the value in it. Okay, cool. But the problem is when you have outsiders coming in trying to invest in something that only a small group of people really see value in, the issue is there's not enough people to sell it to. The market of people who truly find find value in it is small. All you're doing it doing is selling it to other people who want to sell it to other people. You're never actually selling it to the person who ultimately just want to hold it and have it as theirs for the value of the underlying asset. That's the problem to me. All right, here we go. We got Marcus, we got Dwayne, and we got someone who has no name. It just says default. So let me bring up uh, Marcus. Marcus, you live on there. What's going on? What it do? <laughs> so basically, I just ran across your channel like a month ago, and I ain't going to cap, dog. I've been binge watching your <laughs> videos, dog. I just ran across your channel a month ago. I'm so glad you exposed me, folk. I'd be really like, man, that right, but this one right here, bro, uh -huh. I feel like you got it wrong, bro. I, check, check this out, dog. I'm willing to listen. Stop. I think people mess up when they look at NFTs and think about monkeys because it got way more utility than that. Okay. But it just said it's backed by nothing. But mm -hmm. if I was to shake your hand on a contract, that's backed by nothing. I just shook your hand. That ain't nothing. NFTs are a smart contract. Okay. I'd rather have a contract with somebody that's on file versus shaking somebody's hand that's one okay. i'm talking about the utilities of an nft now let's well, look into the right, gaming let's talk, world let's talk about the utility what's the utility let's let's think about the gaming world okay, okay. well you know what let's back up utility let's say what you do first of all i'm going to book a consultation because like i said just ran across your channel i've been binge watching i know mm -hmm. you know what you're talking about i'm going to book a consultation but let's just say you had nfts to say Whoever buy these NFTs, they can be able to tap in on an hour-long consultation at any time. They'll just have to pick a schedule. People will line up because that NFT has utility. I can be able to, with this NFT, go get consultation. I can go get somebody to look over what I got going on and to advise me on what, what my next move should be. That's a form of utility. Not, And you can even say, hey, whoever got my utility, I'm going to drop them some merch. So that's what I'm saying. So they kind of listen. To... Let let let's press pause right there before we move to your next point. Let's okay. press pause right there. Okay. That is an absolutely great example. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I'm on the same page as you. Right, right. Like I can take like for my profession as a financial advisor, I can create an NFT mm -hmm. where if the open public buys this NFT, they can then redeem that NFT for a one hour consultation with the pocket watchers. Is that, is right, that correct? Right, right. All right. Here's where I get a little confused. There's already a medium of exchange to do that. It's called money. But how can so somebody support you in Africa if they don't got a bank account? How can somebody support you in Hong okay. Kong? All right. So I, I got, okay. So point number two. So, I think you will agree with point number one, where the utility of said NFT that you were talking about is basically the same thing as just using money now, right? Exactly. Okay, but now let's move on to point number two. Point number two is, well, what about the guy in Africa who has what? Doesn't have money or in it? What, what don't they have? He doesn't have a bank account. He doesn't have a bank account. Right. Okay, all right. So this person in Africa... They do not have a bank account. But they got a phone. But they have a phone with good internet and cell phone reception. Right. Okay. Well, there are bank accounts or ways to store currency electronically, right? Like when I cash app back and forth, Vimo, and now you have the Federal Reserve doing Fed now. There's countries like our neighbors to the north who they don't use these uh, private company 
uh, processors because their federal government has a transaction system where they're able to move money back and forth. So just as easy as the person in Africa with their cell phone, just as easy as they could buy cryptocurrency and use that as a medium of exchange, they can also have an account with a bank that is digital, right? Because right. once again, how are they buying the crypto, right? Let's 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 walk the logic all the way out. How how, how is the guy in Africa with no bank account? How does he buy the crypto? He gets paid in crypto. He, he gets so he gets he gets paid he gets paid in crypto. So he works and a he's job able and to get, get that crypto. crypto and buy could, different products with it. So if you but, had, but couldn't he couldn't he get paid in cash represented digitally on a debit card or represented digitally on an account the economy on their phone? Uh, everybody's fiat is crashing, even the dollar. Everybody. So what about these countries whose they money ain't nothing? They are rather own Bitcoin versus their own country's currency. OK. All right. Well, um, let's talk about that. There was a there was a country that adopted Bitcoin as like a part El of Salvador, their financial system. Are, are you familiar with that? Yes. A couple countries did. OK. How is that working out for them? Their country is thriving. Which it's, one? It's it's in Mexico. It's a. Uh, Did you it's, say there's a there's a country in Mexico? It's a it's a. Country. Or is Mexico the country? No, wait a minute. It's a country. I think it's El Salvador or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they changed their currency and put it basically. They backed it by Bitcoin, okay. and it struggled for a bit until uh, it's still it's still struggling. It's still struggling, I, and, and I recently watched a documentary on it. That's why I can talk on it. Uh, there was an actual journalist who went to this country, mm -hmm. and he went around trying to buy things with Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. most of the shops, most of the vendors, did not want to do business with him, even though the government gave basically everyone like thirty dollars worth of Bitcoin. They took the money. They converted it to their own currency yep. and put it in their pocket. It's yep. not doing very well. Okay. This is my next point. Okay. Stump me out on this. All right. The gaming world is a multi-billion dollar world. Okay. You got games like Candy Crush that have in-app purchases of millions of dollars a month. Mm-hmm. They're not buying anything physical. Right. They're buying things that can help them inside of that game. Mm -hmm. Back when we had the pandemic, a lot of people start being in the house, getting on the Internet, connecting with people from all over the globe. Right. You had different games coming out like headsets that you can put on and you can connect with people. Right. People was basically having NFTs and being able to play it in these different worlds. Mm -hmm. And it's unique because if I know I'm an avatar in this world and I'm walking around with some J's on my feet and it's only 10 on release and these are the NFTs, that's going to be valuable. People going to be like, man, look, ain't number one or 10 of those. You got those. Right. So the resold there is a market for nfts because you got to think about gaming and you got to think about the evolution of gaming and how people is able to connect with people all over the world live right and able to buy things that can go along with their avatar she okay shoes, hey, boots. This, this is another this is another great great example so i'm not a huge gamer really the only video game that i played from high school all the way up until now is Madden. Madden okay. is really don't Madden and Tetris. Those are the two games I play. Show you how how big of a game I am. I play Tetris because I love playing puzzle block games, and I play Madden. Now, I've been playing Madden online for a long time. Okay. I've been playing Madden against kids from all over the world. I've right. had kids from the other side of the world cuss me out while they get a touchdown <laughs> all over the world. 
Now, I've been able to play with them. I've been able to buy certain uh, uniforms and special players and all that. I've been doing this with cash. So how is how how is cryptocurrency changing the game? Everything that you talked about can be done with cash. It's already being done with cash. How is crypto or NFTs improving the situation? Because what is your cash right now when that same dollar can't even buy what he used to buy? It don't have its buying power anymore. A lot of people is losing their wealth right now. Okay. But I think we can agree that one Bitcoin today does not buy what one Bitcoin two years ago could buy. At one point, Bitcoin was over like $50,000. Is that correct? But Bitcoin... Uh -huh. has, it, yep, you, you're right. You're right. How much is a Bitcoin now? Half. So what's the difference? Still got the same amount of circulating supply. While yeah, but I'm saying... It's about to print but the up point, more money. I just want to be clear because I'm not trying to be... I'm just... Listen, the point that you were just making was the value of the dollar is less today than it was the previous day. Right. And I think we also agree the value of Bitcoin is less today than it was previously. True. So how is one an improvement over the other? Because of the circulating supply. There is. Oh, so now no this is a new point. This is a new point because the, the point we just said were, were equal. So now there's a new point. It's the circulation. Right. Okay, let's move on to the circulation. This got to be your last point. Go right ahead. No problem. All right. The government about to print out some more money right now. Okay. So that means the money we holding on to is about to get devalued right now. Okay. In time, when people started to adapt cryptocurrency, because it's still early, and people still trying to weave out, the SEC trying to still figure out what's going on, people are going to start pulling back from their government's currency and start tapping in to something more global. I feel like, okay. and I'm done with it. All right. So be before you leave, a couple of questions. Have you ever heard of quantitative tightening? Hello? Man, my, my thumb was over the speaker. I have heard of it. I okay. can't define it, but I heard of it. Okay. All right. Well, most people are somewhat familiar with quantitative easing, right? Mm -hmm. That's when the government is putting money into the system, right? Right. But quantitative tightening is when the government is taking money out of the system, right? Okay. Talking about like the Federal Reserve. And they do these things to increase the circulation of cash and they do the things to restrict it so it's not a one-way street i think okay. you're under the impression that the government only prints money and prints money and prints money and put money out into circulation but there's also tools that the government uses to pull back on money that's in circulation that's one of the reasons why the federal reserve currently they're increasing interest rates on money why because they're trying to restrict the economy. They're trying to make it harder for people to borrow money. So it's not a one-way street where they just print money, print money, print money, and it devalues. The things that they're doing now as far as trying to restrict access to money and when they, when the government is actually buying things in the market, uh, well, yeah, when they're buying things and taking money out of circulation, it actually increases the value of it. So it, it goes up and it goes down. So it's not just a one way, a one way thing. But Marcus, listen, feel free to call me up <laughs> and book a consultation. We, I could, we could have a deeper conversation on that. All right. I got a few more people and then we're going to wrap this thing up. I got default because that's all I see. So I'm going to pull you up. Default, you're live on the air. What's going on? What's going on, man? Um, just interesting conversation. Um, a lot of it is misinformed. And I think that's the biggest issue. Is, okay. um, a lot of people don't understand um, that really, if you like, I keep hearing, uh, I don't understand. I don't get the crypto thing. I don't understand. It's, if you really look at it, it's raw capitalism. 
it, it's it's okay. a it's an economy that is being built digitally. And when you look in that aspect, you'll start to understand the concepts better. And when one of the callers said that the whole space is backed by nothing, is back there's no there's nothing back in it. It's backed mm -hmm. by the technology in the community. Whether okay. you're in the community elaborate. Excuse me? Elaborate. Explain it to me. So your community, like um, developers, investors, um, creators, people mm -hmm. that create art, which are NFTs, mm -hmm. um, one aspect of NFTs, um, it's a digital economy, a digital mm -hmm. community that is mm -hmm. bringing value. Uh, and that value is going to be based on supply, supply and demand. That's why I said is raw capitalism. Um, I think people don't understand fundamentals of the economy. They don't understand okay. fundamentals of finance. That's why you have your show and you benefit from that. Um, and you have countless tales of people getting, you know, swindled and scammed from these type of, you know, the, the, this, this mis misinformation, information, sorry. Right. But I, I wanted to also touch on one of the callers though. I think the first thing I heard when I logged in actually was about the tulip media. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's the misinformation. There is the conflation of the NFT market and like the regular crypto currency market. Um, she was kind of comparing the whole cryptocurrency space as the tulip mania. But mm -hmm. I would I would argue, you know, when you had that tulip bubble, after the bubble, you know, exploded, the the price of tulips never reached those heights ever again. That's right. why it's called the tulip bu bubble. Right. But if you look at the history, the you know the ten plus years of Bitcoin's price action, mm -hmm. yes, it has it risen dramatically and crashed dramatically, but it, it's mm -hmm. all it's always increased in value. So the, the compared to the well, tulip it, media, it, it technically hasn't always. But I get the I get the point that you're saying. But I think you're you're confusing Bitcoin within itself with cryptocurrency altogether. No. I, no, you I'm not to, confusing. You have to take the industry for what the industry is. And for I'm, what the industry is, I think we can, can probably even, agree that over 90% of all cryptocurrencies, because there's one made probably every 10 minutes, over 90% of all cryptocurrencies probably have zero value. That is somewhat true. But when I said Bitcoin, and she was, she was putting Bitcoin into that tool of media, well, that, because Bitcoin is a part of the overall cryptocurrency, though. But if I'm specifically talking about one cryptocurrency mm -hmm. that has gained value over the previous value numerous times, that's right. not a that's not a tulip bubble. Well, that that's my point. It, it it's some it is somewhat, but I don't want to leave Bitcoin by itself because we're talking about. We're talking about cryptocurrency together, but I want to I want to address your community question, right? Or your right. community point, the point that you made about it's the community, right? Mm -hmm. I think the problem here is everyone is not a part of the community, right? Um, I never was a fan of Pokemon. I just I, I was just aged out. By the time Pokemon cartoons and video games were popping, I was probably in high school. Wasn't my thing. Now, I'm sure there's a bunch of people who probably found Pokemon when they was in college and they got on it. Whatever it is, I, I wasn't with it. Now, I'm sure that there is a Pokemon card out there that is worth thousands of dollars. But not to me. I would never buy a Pokemon card for anything at all because it, it has absolutely zero value to the kid has zero value to me, right? But within a particular community, like Logan Paul or somebody, he'll pay thousands and thousands of dollars for it because it's valuable to that community. But just because it's valuable to someone within that community who has that amount of money, who values it at that point, doesn't really mean it's worth that to the greater community. So that's why we say it's backed by nothing because the general population does not place that type of monetary value on it other than 
hoping that someone else does so that they can sell it to that sucker. Whether you, you can call them a sucker, whether you can call them a customer, whatever you call them, mm-hmm. as long as there's a market, there's a market. Right. So you're, you could, you're, you're right. There's not a large community, but no. there is a community. Yeah. And it, there is a market. So it yeah. does have value. To say it's backed by nothing, I mean, you have multi-trillion dollar companies that are technology companies. Now, they mm-hmm. might have consumer products like Apple, or they could be like what we're using, YouTube, mm-hmm. which is, is backed by code. Um, is, you know, it's part of Google. It's part of a larger you know, infrastructure. But it's right. still primarily backed by code. So, I, I, like I said, I think the the issue that most people are having is they really don't understand the the economy they're in. They don't understand mm-hmm. if you don't understand that the economy that you're in, you don't understand the pros and cons of it. Crypto is trying to fill in a way to, like, okay, there's issues with. Um, Let's say, um, with say you have you have a banking issue, as okay. far as like you want you want to move, you know, a large sum of money. Okay. Now, if you traditionally, I mean, not traditional, but if you you know you're in finance, if you make a large purchase over, you know, ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars, that's not only will that be registered to the IRS, but also there could be some weights and could be some, you know, enormous fees depending on how much you're sending to an individual. So I'm like, if, I, if I'm wiring money, right? If I'm wiring money, <laughs> there's a fee to wire money. Yes, that is. Wire correct. money. Yes. With crypto, that's one use case where it tried to fill in that solution where you can send money to anybody unlimited without any middleman. The, the, the thing can... Uh-huh. There's no middleman, but there's fees. What are gas fees? There are gas fees, but I mean, let's not step over that too quickly. There's gas fees. Could you explain what that is? Gas fees are basically a a fee to transaction to transact on the blockchain. To send to send crypto, there's a there's a a fee depending on what blockchain you're using. Right. Will determine the fee. All right. So 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 let's just. Take a take a pause here. I agree. There is no middleman in crypto, the same way that there may be a middleman in banking. If I wire two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from my bank to a different bank, they are going to charge me a wire fee. That bank is the bank that's going to get that fee for me transferring that money. That's the middleman. If I attempt to do the same thing with crypto, there is still a transfer fee, correct? That's correct. So what's the difference? Even though it's not a middle man, it's a middle blockchain. How much much would be the fee for that wire transfer? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Wire fees, off the top of my head, I don't know them off the top of my head. You can send it on, you know, a Tron blockchain. Um, using USDT or USDC, and what would it be? One dollar. It'd be one dollar. And that's just off the top of my head. I've, my, I've my seen, thing is, I've there's, there's higher than that though. Yeah, if you use different blockchains, if you right, use different that's, that's protocols. So the same way with banks, a fee may be a little different from one bank to another. See, I mean, I, I, it's, like, it's like it's like it's a solution in search of a problem, and I'm looking for the problem. It's some. Um, that this is, is supposed to solve. That's all. It, That's all. I recognize that it's technology. I recognize that it serves a function. I'm only looking for the problem that it solves that's better than the solution that's currently in place. That's it. Well, wait, just before I go off, what's your mm-hmm. NFTs? Um, if you're using, if you're an artist, say musical artist, and you're using platforms like, well, I don't know how much prof- how profitable you are now because most people don't buy music. Mm-hmm. But say, you, in theory, you want to sell your music on Apple, which charges, you know, for their App Store, their their Apple Music, it charges thirty okay. percent. So you right off the top, you lose thirty percent every song you sell. 
you could use. And I believe you, I, you brought up Tory Lanez or something like that. I think he did something something in the in the realm of this. Right. You could sell those songs um, using the NFT technology directly to consumer. You could cut out the middleman. You don't have to. You, that's, great point. That's it. Great, uh, great point. Great point. So if I if I was to use a middleman uh, uh, media company like Apple Music, you gave the number that hey they'll charge uh 30% on the money that I would make from selling my music to the individual. Great point. And then you say, well, if they were to use an NFT, they can dramatically reduce the uh, dollar amount of the fee to be able to interact with their audience, correct? That's correct. But what if I just put music on my own website to my fans? You could, but are you selling the music? I'm, I'm yeah. just giving you what, 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 yeah, absolutely. I can sell my music to my fans directly without having to go through Apple. You could do that as well. That, it, see, that's what I'm getting at. But I, listen, I, listen, I don't but see listen. the, I don't see the problem that the crypto or the NFT is solving the problem, that is the, superior. To the solution that's already in place. See, the reason why the artist wants to go to Apple is because Apple already has a group of customers who get their music from Apple, right? It's, when you want to be independent, what you're afraid of is will my audience, will my fans come to my website to get my content? Same thing that we experience here on YouTube, right? Whenever, and, and I appreciate it, brother. I got to go to the next one. But whenever a YouTuber gets deplatformed or whenever a YouTuber loses the partnership with YouTube, right? They always make the threat. Well, I'm going to start my own website. I, forget YouTube got too many rules. They take way too much money. Uh, I, I'm going to start my own website and I'm going to start putting my videos up on that website. And what happens? A very small percentage of their audience follows them to the website. That's why they continue to make videos on YouTube because it is a partnership. YouTube has a audience of people who go to this app, our website, or however you interact, and they look for content. And if you're there, they will watch. But if you go on your own platform, you have to actually get it out the mud. You have to actually build an audience and get them to travel from one application to your application, and that's the problem. I don't see how NFTs or crypto is solving that. I I, I, I just don't. I'm I, I'm open to hear it though. I I'm not staying on all night. I'm getting the rest of these calls. No new callers. I'm looking at all the names on the screen right now. No new callers. But if you're on right now, we're gonna do this. I got Dwayne. Dwayne, you're live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on? What's going on, JT? How you doing? It's Dwayne from the Midwest, um, fellow professional. Listen here. Yes, sir. Um, I love the work you're doing. You're a pioneer for us in this, in this profession in our community. Because Blaze is listening to you. There's some basic economics that we're not taking here. First of all, I jot, I jotted down a couple of notes. First of all, mm -hmm. what I noticed about the conversation that we have a problem. We don't know what the basic fundamental or what money is. And it's purest mm -hmm. from a definition. Mm -hmm. People, money is not gold. Money is not silver. Money is not crypto. Money is either thing. Money is and always will be your labor and time denominated in some form of currency or unit. That's what money a medium, is. A medium of exchange of value. That exactly. this, this is my this is my pocket watcher definition. This is what I normally tell students when I go speak at schools or whatever. Yes, money is the medium of exchange of value. Right, you have something that I want. Right? Yes, maybe it's uh, uh, some food. Maybe it's a video game. Whatever it is, I need to exchange value for value. Mm -hmm. Back in the old days, it was a bartering system. Mm -hmm. You had a cow. I had 10 chickens. We traded. The issue with that is you have to rely on what's referred to as the, uh, 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 what is it? Like the randomness of value exchange. Meaning right. 
Like, there's no guarantee that I'm going to have the 10 or 20 chickens that you want for the cow, right? I have to depend on maybe you want what I got. I know I want what you got, but I also have to find what you want. That's why when money comes in the picture, now we have an agreed upon medium of exchange and I don't have to search for what you want because you can then take this medium of exchange, this exchange of value from me to you and it makes commerce simpler. Exactly. So it's a technology. Okay. So we got that. So so the just like gold and silver was a technology, the dollar is a technology. And another the question. Technology, I well, was, like well, the term, I mean, it depends on the way you're using the term. Well, the way I'm using it, what the fact, the way I'm using it is a technology in terms of a concept. So the, it was a concept, you know, people, somebody said, well, instead of you giving me chickens, I'll just take this dollar or or, or seashells and we'll right. do that. And it became common amongst the right. Community. And it had to be, you know, it's a gr- it's We're agreed, agreed right, right. We yeah. agree, right, that this particular thing, right, has a value that we both agree upon, so that we can enter into commerce between one another and not have to hope that I have what you want. Right, right. So we have yeah. that. That's how the next question was said the difference between the Bitcoin and the dollar. Well, here's mm-hmm. the difference between the Bitcoin and the dollar. Right now, people are talking about this. This I, I, I heard this community is built by the community. I can, it's an economy. It could do something like this. You have to be very careful with that because I think you put up the accredited investor. This is a very, this requires levels of sophistication. What's been going on? What corporate Americans have been doing very well with um, um, internet since the internet come, they have been using the public as pretty much the um, pre-marketers of uh, what you know when you sell, you open up a business, you have what you call pre-sales. You right. don't know how it's going to go. So you, and that's called costly. So what they're doing is they're just putting it out to the public. That's why most of this stuff is free until they find out they because they're collecting data until they find out what the data is. Then okay. what they collect out the data is they'll bring it under regulation. As you know, right now it's going with the SEC with the um, XRP. They're slowly bringing it under under regu- regu- uh, regulation. So mm-hmm. the difference between a dollar is the dollar is you have legal protection. In, in the dollar system, in the, pretty much any system, any government system, because what's the difference between Bitcoin and the dollar is there's an army back in that dollar. There's no army. There's no there's no army ready to go to war with Bitcoin. They're, they don't have an arsenal of nuclear weapons that's going to make sure that defend their, uh, um, their Bitcoin because there's no sovereignty behind it. Now, what you have to be careful of People that are experimenting with blockchain right now, you're the guinea pigs. You're the it's like 1929 all over again before the crash, before you had um um um, um the SEC 1940 laws, before you had anything of that. It was free fall. There was no laws. People was trading, doing all type of stuff. Well, then, <laughs> then, <laughs> then, <laughs> then they came in. Just and, to clear up, there there were laws. Yeah, there were. Right. They weren't as strict, right? Yeah, so there were laws like they 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 had counterfeiting laws, right? Yeah, well, they had those your, types. You couldn't make your own currency, right? right. So those types. It wasn't just like a free yeah. for all. There were certain. What laws I mean in terms of this tech- wasn't it wasn't as regulated. You had a lot of uh, businesses that yes. were cooking the books, and then they also needed to bring in regulations where these businesses had to open up and give proper information to the investors because they were basically lying about the stability of the companies and stuff like that. There there was a bunch of stuff. There were people who were buying securities on margin way more than they should have. And the way that they were tracking that wasn't correct. So there were some laws, but they weren't as strict to help. Yeah, but those laws, but but let me go back. back. The the laws that I'm referring to in terms Mm -hmm. of the phenomenal one was the stock market. The stock market was it, it was brought to the public. There was no anybody could start it. It was new. It was a crazy thing. Sort of like NFT. Sort of like blockchain. It was brand new. It was the the Wall Street. The, the whole Wall I, I Street. Got, hold on, I got. I got. I got. I got to push back on. just a little bit. Hold on. Hold on. No, no, real quick, hold real quick. I got to push back because okay, go the stock market was not new 
in 1929. Like, no, it, that's it not what I'm saying. Thing. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm it wasn't saying it was five years old. Blood, it wasn't 10 years old. It wasn't common, the, though. It, it wasn't the common. Stock market was yes, what the stock market was. The issue is you had a bubble that was created based upon a lot of bad financial information, a lot of companies basically pumping and dumping in a sense of uh, of their own stock and regulation had to come in. It wasn't new in the same way that cryptocurrency is new now. But it but what I'm saying, it was the, the way the products and the things mm -hmm. that they were bringing up, those concepts, those ways, that way of investing, that um, that whole Wall Street thing, that was relatively new. And plus, it was That's brought. Serious. No, Not 1929. No. no, listen to what I'm saying. It was relatively. I'm 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 bro, I'm, try I'm trying to. I'm, I'm just saying the listen. stock market and investing in equity. I'm not saying buying a fractional listen. share of a company was not something new in 1929. That's not what I'm saying. So you're getting okay, okay. okay. So okay. so break it down because you said it was new. I'm trying to figure. I'm out talking about the new. whole concept. What I'm saying, new to the public, it was brought to the public. The public, it wasn't common. Most most people that was investing in stock, you had to be some type of um, you had to be in the know. You pretty pretty much if you were if I don't you, agree. If you were I, I don't agree because this, this is what we're gonna this. disagree at. This is yeah, yeah just, disagree. I, I just wanna I just wanna explain something. Maybe you got it, but some people watching don't, okay. don't get it. The reason why a company goes public, right? There's a difference between a private company and a public company. Course. A private company has investors from a small pool of people. The reason why a company goes public is because they want access to a larger group of people who then have an opportunity to invest in the company. So, they so the thing that a lot of people didn't know or it was hard to invest in a public company kind of defeats the purpose of what a public company is for. A public company is, you go public because you want a large group of people to have an opportunity to invest and buy your stock. So to say that a lot of people didn't know is kind of backwards because that's why you go public. You want a lot of people to know so that you can then have new investors. But that's not what I'm saying, sir. I'm saying that I'm they, saying the they, concept the the concept wasn't the, the reason why the public wasn't didn't have access to those type companies. What public? What public? The general public. Like you could go out to you could go a company could start up because generally you had to go to private investors. You had to go around shop around. You yes. had to go get that from investors. But yes. when the stock market in 1920, they said we're going to make it public. Now we're going to go public. And that's we're the gonna, point that I'm trying to make. That, huh? That's the point I'm trying to make. Wait a minute. That's what I'm trying to make. It was new. It was new. It was a new concept. It was a new new environment of investment. Investment That was new. That's how it became a mania. That's how it became speculative because everybody was, everybody was, because it was new. They didn't have that before. That's why it was new. So, no so are you under the belief that the stock market started in 1929? No, I don't believe the stock market started. I, I'm saying when, when do you believe the stock market started? Man, the stock market probably started ancient. I mean, we go back to slavery. That the buying bu buying interests and, and, and stakes in companies was the, the basic fundamental of buying a company is, is that's the stock market. That's been around forever. I don't know the exact date on it, but that's been around. So, so why I'm talking about I'm so why in 1929, why why is it in 1929 do you believe that a lot of people were made aware that weren't aware previously? Because, well, actually it would be prior to, before 1929, 1929 is when this um, crash happened. Right. But prior before that, companies were able, companies were, because we had a new influx of capital coming in, people was going able to start things, start, start things up, and it was access to the public. You heard this story, I think that was... um. What's the story? It's an old school story. If you've been around the investing community for a time, I think it was Henry Ford or Rockefeller, one of them, when he mm -hmm. said that um he went to go shine his shoes and a guy and, and the shoe sign guy said, I'm gonna give you a stock tip. And when he heard the shoe sign boy he said he, he gonna give him a stock tip, he wouldn't sold all his he, he wouldn't sold all his stocks because it was so common to the general public. That's what I'm saying. It was it was out there in the general public because before that was reserved for the Aristocrats. That was reserved for those. I, see, I know. I, I I see the point that you're making. I think you're. 
I think you're missing the point of that story. The point of the story wasn't that because Henry Ford or whoever heard that a common person was giving him a particular tip. The issue is by the time that the everyday person is saying, oh, this is a hot stock, like let's say Tesla, right? When everyone's telling you to get into Tesla, it's it's probably pretty much over in the sense of you're not going to see this huge growth in the particular stock because it's now everyone knows it's not as if you're getting in on the ground floor. But it's it wasn't just that, a stock. But it's it wasn't not, just a stock. He was looking at the whole market, though. He wasn't it, looking at one stock. He was looking at the whole entire market. Like, wait, wait a minute. The shoe sign guy t- talking about stock market now. That was something. That was our. That was something that we have. So we have yeah, totally. I don't, booked, I don't, I don't think we you got agree? that story correct. Oh I'm, yes, I'm I do, that. sir. Yes, I do, sir. I'm, I, I'm going to right. push back on that, sir. I have that story. He was looking at the whole entire market because he knows. Well, yeah, he knows saw that about. the market had a bubble, but not right. the fact that oh, now people know. People have always known. No, I mean, no. People have access. Access. Listen, when whenever you have a lot of access of capital in the stock market, when you have, if you have access, like for instance, now you have people who get into Airbnb. When, when Airbnb came out, it gave more people, that technology, that concept allowed more and more people to get into that arena. It became inflated because it was access, because it's, it's unregulated, it's uncharted territory. All I'm saying is- It is they, regulated, but uh, I, I get the point you're saying. But that what Airbnb I'm saying is- It's regulated. It's, un, it's, it's not regulated to the point where they have, they have um, regulations. They have problems that they cannot see that they need to regulate. They can't see the problem they need to regulate because it's not matured yet. The market, that market has matured because New, it's so- New York City, New York City just regulated. They, they, they did what? They There you go. They just yeah, they, regulate. They just right, regulate. Okay, yeah, New York City, just, other places like Atlanta did a while ago. Well, they no, Atlanta just did it just recently, fairly recently. Other states- Not as, are, not as recently as New York. Yeah, because it's new. They just regulated. They're just now regulated because they're- I mean, it was up. an additional regulation. It right, already so was somewhat regulated right, because before, they, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it wasn't because the market wasn't mature. All I'm saying right now is the technology that you have right now, the market's not mature enough, right? And the people that's in these community, they're paying the price. They're paying the price. They're doing the legwork. They're doing all of it. It's a brilliant plan, by the way. They're doing all the legwork. They're getting, they're working all the kinks out. And then there'll probably be some mania, some, some, some historic event that'll come in. Then we'll get more regulation on it say so we got to do something about these crypto these nfts is going down people using all this and then that's when a regulation will come in right now my thing is if you're speculating in crypto right now you need to be aware that it's highly expectable uh, speculate it's unregulated it doesn't matter if you have a community the community is it's not in comparison with the dollar because the dollar is a backed by a sovereign nation no cryptocurrency well, that, that, the be main difference than- and i i had that in my notes that i wanted yeah. to to say the main difference for me, the difference between Bitcoin and a dollar is that you are required to accept a dollar mm. or as a medium of, uh, of Correct. exchange. You're Correct. not required to accept Bitcoin. Exactly. That's the difference. Exactly. Also, when you added too. the fact that the dollar is a true currency, while Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency is not really a currency because there is a tax implication upon every transaction. There's no tax implication if I go to the store and buy some candy. There's a tax implication if I go to the store and buy candy with Bitcoin. But I will say this, if I get it, and then I'll yield. Mm-hmm. But I will say this. You mentioned that guy talked about the gas fees. Mark my words, yeah. JT. Remember, I said it on, what is it, uh, September 29th, 2000, right. um, uh, 1039. He said that you asked him a very important question. He said that you, he don't have to pay wire fees. Then you said, well, they're gas fees. Well, right. the gas fees are lower. I can bet you whatever catastrophic event happened in the crypto, in a blockchain space, mm. those fees, once regulation kicks in, those fees will begin to become higher. Don't know if they call them gas fees, water fees, whatever fees they're going to have. Right. When regulation comes in, it's going to be higher. Right now, I'm saying this right now, if you're playing in that space, 
you are playing, you are pretty much, you're pretty much the guinea pigs, but you have to, because you're taking on risk, just be aware. And, and that's a, and I think that's the theme of your whole um, thing. When you show, put up the credit investor, just mm -hmm. be aware of the type of risk, how speculative it is and, right. and be realistic that you don't go and mortgage the house and say, I'm going to be rich with an NFT when you don't understand the technology or don't understand the economic space. That's all I got to say, brother. Hey, and we, and we absolutely 100% agree on that point over probably 90 percent of the population are not in a financial position to invest in something so speculative i absolutely agree with that all right we got dre john evans and 516 mike we're gonna get through this and we're gonna wrap this thing up so let me get dre dre you're live on the air what's going on hey what's going on brother jt love your content very uh, thank important. you uh, I, I wish you had the brother Eli on here because uh, he's probably one of the yeah, most. He, listen, Eli, Eli is light years ahead of me when it comes to the technology behind this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely aware. You know, I, I know uh, from a financial, from a tradfi standpoint, you're definitely on point. But uh, pretty sure he follows the crypto space a lot more than you. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I would say I do also. And I think a lot of people are misinformed and it's sad because, again, this technology is absolutely going to revolutionize the future. It's already in the midst of doing that. And it's mm -hmm. going on right under people's nose. I, well, give me some examples, because once again, oh, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for the problem. OK, so that are you cryptocurrency familiar? is the solution for that is better than the solution that's already in place so i'll uh, give number it to one me. number one security you can't hack bitcoin's network so that's uh perhaps the most important problem uh well, time that, out time out you said security is that correct correct absolutely okay so you're telling me there's no situation where a person was hacked and lost their cryptocurrency no I, i'm telling you that you can't hack bitcoin's network like you can hack bank of america or government not, i'm not talking so, about that. So I'm concerned far as, about me, the individual yeah, but, person. But that would be your integrity. If someone, hold on. If someone yeah. was to hack into my bank and they take five zeros away from the number that I have at the bank, I could call that bank and based on fraud, get my money back. If and someone so, was to uh, do that to me with cryptocurrency, what is my recourse? So in some cases, not all cases, you can you can uh, view uh, the research and not all people get their funds back when they do lose it. Through. No, no, no. no. I'm not, I, 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 we got that. But I'm talking about on, on your side when it comes to the crypto. If I was hacked and someone takes my Bitcoin or whatever, what is my recourse? Oh, you have no recourse. I mean, I, I have think no recourse, but, but no but, recourse. So so let's let's just be clear. Uh, so, what, yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm going to give you all the time. But I'm going to give you all the time. Of, listen, I ain't got nothing to do. I'm going to give you all the time, but I just want to make perfect. sure that we're on the same page. Perfect. But when, when it when comes I'm to the... Hold on, what is this? What is this? Dre, just give me a second. When it comes to the current banking system, you and I agree. The current banking system is not perfect. There are situations where you can be a victim of fraud and you do not get your money back. Let's say... I have $300,000 in my bank account. Let's say, for example, I have $300,000 in my bank account and I go to I go to a small bank. This very small bank, they, they file for bankruptcy. This small bank fails. They do not have enough money to pay me any of my money back. But because it's FDIC insured, I would get $250,000 back from the federal government. I would have lost $50,000, but I would have got $250,000 back. That is not a perfect system. A perfect system, I would get 100% of my money back. So it's not a perfect system. But when we go to crypto, same situation, I have $250,000 in my email, right? In my email, and my email gets hacked, and now I have zero. And you admit, very honestly, that I have no recourse. It's not that I only get 250 of my $300,000 back, 
the way that I get with an FDIC insured bank, I get none of the money. And I can actually look at the ledger and see the wallet that my money went to. And there's no authorities that I can point to and say, look, I can show you right here. This is the wallet. It went from my wallet to this wallet. I can show you where my money went. And you're telling me, quite honestly, I have no recourse. Is that correct? Uh, not not true. Not all the time. Because if you look at Mount okay. Gox and the Mount Gox hack, a lot mm -hmm. of those people are about to get their cryptos right now. Specifically, Okay, how? How, now, how is that happening? Because, again, it went through the litigation. They found that uh, that, that uh, exchange was at fault. And a okay. lot of people their crypto and because so, of their so they're they, reversing so so what are you telling me are they are they reversing those transactions yeah a lot of people a lot of those people are I gonna thought, get back. but i thought code was the law i thought we don't change code uh i'm not sure i follow what you're trying to imply okay uh, let's 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 just look at this i thought that we don't change the code so are we reversing the, that transaction now the code does not change it's just those people were victims of fraud, same as right. your bank, at no fault of their own, same as your banking example. Okay. And since we have this technology, we're able to see people's wallets and right. the amount of funds there, and they can be reimbursed. So okay, great. So who's who's making this happen? Uh, the authorities by because Mount Mount Gox had uh hundreds of thousands of bitcoins. So right. they're so getting there's it some happen. there's some central authority that's making this happen. Uh, it's the government, of course, just like with oh. your bank. Oh, so the, so this decentralization right. thing wasn't wasn't helpful. A government was actually helpful as a recourse for no. them to get their money back. Actually, it was actually very helpful. I mean, I, I have to disagree with that. Decentralized. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> decentralized is the network, but when there's fraud, that when there's you need fraud, government to step in. Well, the people requested the government step in. And and if the people did not request for the government to step in, would they have got their money back? Uh, I'm pretty sure they would have because government would have stepped in anyway. Like we're seeing with that. <laughs> government would have stepped in. So, so once again, I'm asking the question, how is this an improvement on the current system? It's a better secure system. And again, that's how you, it's going to I think we just proved that it's not. No. I don't believe that that example is showcasing that Bitcoin, the network, is not going to get hacked, but uh, Bank of America would, because what you pointed out had nothing to do. I'm not worried about Bitcoin, the network, getting hacked. But I'm that's worried the, about the yeah. individual who has the Bitcoin well, that's them getting hacked that's and the recourse the that they have to get their money back. But that's hold on, that's their negligence. So for speaking on security, <laughs> of the yes, network, regulation is for their name. What, what are you talking about? That's like if I'm walking down the street and I get mugged, and the cop comes to me and say, "Well, you know this is a dangerous neighborhood." Yes, I see the criminal running with 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 the money in his hand, but you knew this was a na dangerous neighborhood. What are you doing? Well, again, you said, "How is it an improvement on?" Yes, the how is it an improvement? Security, and that's my point. But you're it's not. We I think we just went on to that, but let's move to the next point. Okay, well, again, definitely disagree with your example. We can, we can absolutely I'll, agree I'll, on that. I'll, I'll point this out to you. So okay. are you familiar with who Larry Fink is? Not off the top of my head. Wow, you're a financial guy. So he uh he's yeah. a he's the founder and CEO of BlackRock. Are you familiar who BlackRock yes. is? Absolutely, I'm familiar with BlackRock. Wow, yes. okay, well. Uh, you know, he's one of the biggest advocates for cryptos. And he basically, you know, without using these specific words, is talking about how dollars are going to be worthless and it's mm -hmm. unstable. And don't take my word for it. Google mm -hmm. it. It's on YouTube. It And it's these all these currencies are going to be unstable in the future. And right. we need to get to something digitized that, again, is more secure that all countries can depend on because none of them can control to your point on decentralization. Right. And that's why this whole financial system that we have, that's very mm -hmm. slow moving forward in this century. Very is, slow. Oh, correct. Absolutely. Because right. Again, okay. So, so, so I, I want to be clear here. I want to be clear. I, I want to be clear. I want to be clear. So okay. number one, 
that particular person saying making that statement means absolutely nothing to me because it, 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 it means nothing to me because then then i can pull out of my hat and i can talk about warren buffett who calls uh cryptocurrency trash right so that that mm -hmm. that, that, that let's Brother. just say those two things equal themselves out here here's here's the issue with the Brother. here's the issue with the Larry speed Hold on. Larry uh listen dre 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 so those two things don't mean anything because for every big name finance person that's that you can pull that says, hey, this person says crypto is the greatest thing in the world. I can pull out a, another big name finance person who's going to say that it's trash. So that that means nothing to me. Well, but here's let, the point me... about the speed, right? The speed of transactions. Cryptocurrency as of right now, the speed of transactions and the processing of the transactions are extremely slow. Visa which is a system of payment and uh, uh, transfer of, of value with the whole and Visa it's network. Crypto. Visa it's is crypto. way faster than crypto. Crypto is like a, a snail compared to a cheetah when it, you're no. talking about the ability to transact and the speed of the transaction. That's so it's not an improvement. That's actually not true, but okay. But again, Visa- How is that not true? Uh, because- you're looking at Visa's transaction because they compare it to Ethereum, the most transacted crypto network. However, you have a lot of layer twos that are much faster than Ethereum. Give me an example. Can, you, you, well, I can give you an example, but you're not going to know because. But I'll give. I'll give no, you something. Give me an example. Scale, the scale mm -hmm. net, and okay. it costs a fraction of what Visa does. And it's mm -hmm. just as fast. Okay. Not, and how many people are using that system? Uh, you probably have a couple of hundred thousand. Okay. Is that comparable yeah. to the scale of Visa? Oh uh, no, absolutely not. Then how? Then why even give that as an example? Because you're talking. Because we're we're speaking on speed. Right. Correct? And when we're and when you're talking about network. speed, when we're talking about speed, we're also talking about volume, right? Because well, we're talking we're, we're talking about commerce, right? I can so have a very fast uh, motorcycle that can whiz in and out of, of a street, but that motorcycle can only hold so much product. I can have a big rig truck where it's not as fast as that motorcycle, but that big rig truck has a lot of product on it to help but, with commerce. But, but, so but you, it, you have to evaluate speed and the volume. You put those well, together. And Visa well, if your both. point, if your point is that if scale can handle Visa's volume, yeah, they it actually can. And again, that's my point. But going have back to Larry has, Fink, has it? Well, why since, doesn't it? Since we're dealing with a uh, new technology, it's kind of silly to suggest that mm -hmm. an established fifty-plus-year-old system that's the point where i'm trying to say i haven't no. seen the improvement that's that that's all i said show me the improvement the improvement I, I, doesn't I exist it. yet now you say I, the improvement's coming later then cool no, I, I get that point I, the improvement's I, 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 coming later but it's not I didn't say now it, i didn't say it was coming later right okay. now so where's the improvement use, right now if you try to use that network again it would be just as fast and it will cost less with the value huh with the volume that Visa has. Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's okay. a lot faster. And again, you're speaking of Visa, but Visa in the background is using crypto. And they're switching their systems to crypto. So uh, that's why I was like, you should have the brother Eli on. Because right. a lot of people, like I mentioned Larry Fink. BlackRock is going to have a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, this is not like Buffett saying Bitcoin is this or that. He's yeah. actually... He's actually the largest money manager in the world. They will have, the listen, when, it, when it comes to finance, whenever they can find people who are willing to throw money at something, they're going to sell it. We okay. agree with that, right? Uh, okay, sure. I, absolutely. I mean, that, okay. that the system is based on is people right. using financial instruments to profit or for, for their business. When, whenever you Whenever you find a group of people who are willing to buy something, Someone's going to be willing to sell it. Okay. But again, the purpose of me mentioning Fink is not to throw out a name because you can throw out. It's to point out that when they get their Bitcoin ETF approved, 
Mm -hmm. This whole financial system that is slow, he himself said it. He's probably the most accredited person to say it because he manages more money than Buffett. And I'm a student of Buffett. Mm -hmm. He manages $10 trillion. And when they get their Bitcoin ETF, he's already talking about how this whole stock market should be tokenized. And he's in the unique position to do that. You can argue they control the government. So while okay. a lot of people are misinformed and don't even understand what's going on. All right, so so, they, so what, what is your prediction as far as when will we see this? I mean, uh, if you watch, if you watch what Congress was saying to uh, Gary Gensler yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. I, I found it quite amusing. You know, because they're going to get rid of him. He's kind of the only thing in the way. And even if they don't get rid of him, I mean, they're about to subpoena him. You know, that was live testimony in front of Congress where they told him, mm -hmm. you're basically going to put us in the back seat in this revolution that's going on financially. So you okay. can so, either. So, because I, I think there's a confusion here. It's not the technology within itself. What I'm talking about is one, the decentralization. That's not going to happen. It's going to be centralized. If it ever becomes mainstream, it will become centralized. Well, there will certain, be a system of checks and balances. It will be pulled under regulation. Now, if you're saying that when it comes under regulation, when it is centralized, when there are checks and balances, it will be successful, well, then it's not the same thing. Now it's more mirroring actual the actual financial system that we have now, just digital. It's not going to be the wild, wild west cryptocurrency, uh, you know, code is the law. If you lose your money, you just lose. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be a, a situation where it's going to be anonymous, as what people want to say. It's not going to be as anonymous as it was in the past. Oh, absolutely. So uh, my apologies. I didn't catch the beginning of this. So mm -hmm. you 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 probably made that point. And I, I thought we were just strictly talking about the network. Absolutely. Yeah. There's going to be a huge level of centralization. Yeah. Once Wall Street comes, which they're pretty much already here, of course, mm -hmm. they're going to regulate it to the hill. Yeah. And, and, and in the point and the point that I was saying before that that you missed was the regulation was the SEC stepping in. If the SEC steps in, it's regulated. There's not a open market where small investors can get tricked into investing in speculative things. They need to be um, accredited investors and stuff like that. Then it's a different beast. That makes sense. So I, I, on that part, I think we, we agree. So I got, I got to go on to the next one because at some point I got to go to sleep tonight. But yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. Eli knows more than me when it comes to the utility of it. But I'm still I'm still looking for I'm still looking for the problem that it's solving that's far and beyond better than what we currently have. I just right now it's still not better. Then the question is, which crypto? Right? Are we talking about bin coin? Are we talking about? I mean, it's all they're all crypto. So now you have to have some sheriff come in and say that you know X Y Z coin you can't get registered, but this one can't. It's you know, okay. All right, I, I we got John. John in the building. What's going on? Hey JT, how's it going, man? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for calling. Cool, man. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> okay, so um, I've been a developer for years, um, decades now. And when I first started hearing about crypto, I didn't really understand it. So I said, let me get into it. Let me code it out and see if I can understand it. So I actually went in their courses on how you can build the code. I built my own blockchain, all of that stuff to really understand it. Right. And yeah, you're right. <laughs> this is not um, the problem people have is it's trying to solve a problem mm. that it's looking for a solution to like, like you said, a problem that's already there. And more importantly, in my mind, your previous callers, the problems they talked about are problems at the bank level, the interbank level. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bank of America wants to secure it to lose less money from fraud between there and Citibank. Maybe they want to speed up things between right. Bank of America and, and JP Morgan. It's not at the user level. So at the user level, we don't have any real need for it. 
Right. Maybe banks will use crypto, who knows, but it'll be their own isolated technical system. It's not going to be someone else's tool that they purchased or anything like that. Right. right. <laughs> things, things that you can buy, like on an open, like I'm going to buy uh, uh, some of the uh, blockchain that that Citibank is using to be able to send money over or to verify the transfer of money from Citibank to Bank of America. Exactly. It's an even ice, more isolated network. It's like if you talk about technology change, there was a technology sw a, uh, switch from using coins and money, uh, um, like hard physical coins and gold to paper notes. Now, let's say if they are, I said, OK, this technology is going to change everything. We're going to switch to paper notes and they switch to paper notes. That doesn't mean the paper notes I made are worth anything. It's the government's paper notes. So it's really irrelevant. I mean. And one other, uh, two other things. You mentioned, you know, the gas fees as part of like the middleman. That's not the real middleman for these transactions. That's not the real part that slows down the transactions. Yeah, sure. Theoretically, you could move a hundred million dollars um, in XYZ crypto from me to you, whatever. Mm -hmm. The real middleman of the real slowdown is when you try to convert that to cash. Because if you've got a hundred million crypto, it doesn't mean anything. Right. That's the part that slows everything down. That's the part where you're going to pay not the 0.3% that maybe a bank charges, but they're going to hit you with that 5%. You're going to have that change in the value. That's value what it is. liquidity. That, exactly. okay, okay, yeah. So, because like in the market, if I've got like $5,000 worth of S&P 500, I immediately, I can sell it. There's a market maker. I can sell it. I got liquidity. If you've got a hundred million dollars of XYZ coin, you're you're depending on some market maker to give you liquidity in a Absolutely. situation where there's no guarantee that they exactly okay. and that and the big thing is this: all of their solutions, all of the things that they say crypto will make better, are dependent on everyone having already adopted it. Because without that. You don't talk about it. even these all these people. I have a hundred million dollars in crypto. I don't say I have thirty million dollars in Swiss francs. I say I have this many Swiss francs. It's not a, a measure of, of of currency. It's a commodity. I have a hundred million dollars in gold. So that's the issue. Like, and the reason why when it really hit me about where this bubble is and where this idea and where people are getting mistaken is when I looked at the two technologies and how they were adopted, two technologies, blockchain and how its utility versus these new AI, large language models, chat GPT type things. Mm -hmm. And because I'm a data scientist by training, I do a lot of machine learning stuff. Mm -hmm. It took me years to try to figure out some possible solution where I maybe could use a blockchain where it might be better than something else. Maybe if I was in a developing country that was having like their, their currency was crashing, whatever. When large language models and chat GPT came out, you could instantly see, oh, I can do this. This tool can read these claims that I could file in an insurance company and I could replace this many claims processors. I could do this. I could use it as a tool to assist legal um, legal aid and it could act as a paralegal that would make a, an attorney more productive. And this is why you see all these people coming up with new ideas. You right. constantly see methods on how that tool can make what you do better, can make what you do more productive. With this stuff, it's just like for the average person, it doesn't have value. I mean, if you're a libertarian who says, I, I don't want to deal with the government, I don't want people knowing anything that I do, maybe it's got value for you. But if you're just a regular person trying to buy things, right. I just don't see the value. Yeah, and, and, and the thing that I think that they're not getting, and I say a lot, but I don't think they understand, every transaction with cryptocurrency is a taxable event. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they understand the impact on that. Like, I don't think they get it. When I go and I buy something with a dollar, that is not a taxable event. If I go to a store that happens to accept Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, if I go to that store and I use that as my medium of exchange, that is a taxable event. I have either had a short-term or long-term capital gain or short-term, long-term loss. 
I'm going to have to report that on my taxes. Like, I don't think they understand that. And I, the, I think they, I think they think that they, they won't, they can avoid that. They think that the crypto network is enough so they can be hidden and obscured. Almost like that's the feature and not the bug. The problem is for 99.9% .9 of the people, even, let's say it could, let's say you could obscure all of that stuff. When you pay for these, like you said, the taxes, you're paying your taxes and all of that, mm -hmm. you're paying for that insurance, that regulatory insurance, where if I lose my password to my bank account, my bank doesn't say, well, you get two tries to get your password. If you don't, your money's locked up forever. Yeah. The money's on. Exactly. When the bank collapses, I know the U.S. government is going to protect my money and they're going to give me back my money because they make the money. That insurance is what people want. We don't want the average person doesn't want the Wild West. The average person has no need for the Wild West. The reason why our, our dollar is so powerful isn't just our military. It's the stability of our economy. But, and, it's the, and, and here's about the, the anonymous part of it, too. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's not anonymous. I can track your transactions through your wallet. Like, exactly. the average person is not going to have eight different wallets where they funnel transactions back and forth to try to obscure their transactions. The average person is just going to have their wallet. And it's on a ledger. So yep. uh, when you go to the gentleman's club, I, I can see that you went to the gentleman's club because I can see that transaction go from that wallet to this. Like, I, I'll be able to, like, I don't think people understand that part. Like, and the fun we, we can track you. And the funny thing is the guy who was a few calls before actually hinted at this. You talked about Mount Gox and how they're mm -hmm. going to get some of their money back. The reason why they're going to get all, some of their money, not all of it, is do you remember that story of last year about the crocodile of Wall Street, that girl who was this rapper and her boyfriend, these, this white yep. Yep, yep, That yep. was not Gox. What happened was they were moving some money and they were able to be tracked once they put it somewhere where they could convert okay, yeah. some of it into dollars. And then all of a sudden, it's this trail. So, right. and, so yes, the government got, will get them back some of their money. But there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee you get your quarter million back. They'll get some of it. They'll get maybe even most of it back. Right. Is it going to be in today's dollars or is it going to be in yesterday's dollars or oh, whatever? That's such, that's such a good point because it doesn't matter. You could have lost the money when Bitcoin was here. They give it back to you. Bitcoin is here. Exactly. It's Exactly. Exactly. Also, like, yeah, you gave us seventy Bitcoin was set. It was seventy thousand dollars. Okay, we'll pay you back when it's twenty thousand. When it's twenty two thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it. I mean, I, it's once I realized if you have to try to shoehorn a solution to a tech for for technology, yeah, it's not a good bet. It's just not a good bet. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's all I have to say, man. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. That 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 that, that helped me because there was some things I wasn't even looking at. All right, we're gonna get through. We got one, two, three, four. We got four or five more calls. We're gonna go through. We got Evans. We got who is Mike Jones? <laughs> we got Lanes, Blake, and Byron. So let me go to Evans. You're live on air. What's going on? Hey, JT. Uh, big fan. Big fan. Thank and you. I just have to tell you, bro. Like, uh, it, you know. Just, just, just to to. I hope you hear this. Um, it it pays when somebody goes to school and sits down to listen to Doctor whoever he is behind his uh, a name or her name, in terms of a skill set, or in terms of the academia to turn into a skill set because uh, your your subject matter expertise in this space. Frees a lot of people, bro. Like a lot of people, like like a lot of brother. The, the brother called and said, "We put the TV on. I, I can relate. That's when I, I throw on the Merlot and put my cigar on. <laughs> you just you know, I'm entertained. <laughs> it's, 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 I, I'm just a financial advisor, just asking questions. I don't claim to have all the answers. And, I think it and, makes sense to me. And, like, and, and that's all I'm asking for. Listen, make listen, I'm from. For me. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm never gonna try to gas you in no form or fashion, but uh it takes one to know one and it shows that you learned and you studied 
and uh, you're the real deal in what you do. Because a lot of times you, we don't, we don't even vet people. We don't even go to Google. I'm telling you, like I broke a lot of hearts when you did that thing on Robert Smith. When you did that, 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 that like, like, bro, y'all talk about snitching. This is the like one of the. <laughs> I'm talking about he snitched and then paid Uncle Sam over a quarter of a billion dollars to say, please, I don't want to go to jail. So I, did, I didn't even add in the part like if, if people really want to be mad at me, there was so much of that story that I left out. I didn't talk about he how he was courting uh, President Trump and his son in law. Like he was working really, really hard to get on Trump's good side so that he could possibly get a uh, pardon. Allegedly, there's a whole lot of there was a whole bunch of stuff that I left out because I felt like it would just muddy the water. But it's out there. Yeah, it's y'all can find this stuff. And I'm going to give room for more callers, but I just want to say thank you for what you do. And for people that's listening, just do your little homework. Like, I mean, in the days of Google effect, you could Google cats and see that that went, they went to a school that's not even accredited. They went to a so-called university. Don't get me started with your Carson dude. Like, yo, yo bro, yo, bro, you get busy. <laughs> Listen, this is not even, a, this is real life. And we yeah. talked about money. Who else? And you know what's so sad? Mm -hmm. Of course, our value. I took in, in business and B school and business school. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand why I was taking a business and ethic class because I'm like, yo, what the heck? This is common sense. Every yeah. time, listen, brother, you are so on. I, I literally to, to maintain my license and my certification, I've got to do ethics every every year. Hours of ethics every year. Every time I sit there and I ask myself. Who really needs this? This is right. like simple, don't be a crook stuff. <laughs> the more I do this uh, work on this channel, right. I realize there's, there's people who actually need to be trained how right. to be ethical. Right. It's, it's, it's sad, but it's true. Right. I, I was conflict. I mean, I passed the course, but I was conflicted. I'm like, this is a waste of time. Just look at this dude making money off of us. We paying all this money to talk about ethics and business. That don't make no damn sense. But we live in a time uh, that you have to know. And if you don't know, shame on you. <laughs> like, I ain't going to lie. I got caught out there. I did every hustle you could do and stuff like that. I got caught. I never went to jail. I'm not talking about a G-pack or nothing like that. Listen, <laughs> none of that. None of that. And I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like you, you have to, I mean, the values, the values are twisted, first of all, because everybody want to be in the video dancing like Suge said. Yep. Nobody want to mind their business and drink water. Like, I mean, why Why do you care about, they can't even spell uh, NVT or, or, or fiduciary, let alone talk about it uh, in the times that we're living in. But nobody vets them. Well, just because that person is, is, is showing an appearance and putting mm -hmm. on what they call in real estate the stage, you mm -hmm. getting fooled and bamboozled. And I ain't gonna lie, I got caught too. But when you follow the numbers, they don't lie. When you do a little homework, you can see. You can see. And who else would want something good for you? They don't even know you. They don't even know you. Why don't you look out for your sister, your moms, your, 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 your peoples? Right. Why are you looking out? Why do you think you're gonna get this gift from, from this so-called black Jesus? Like that don't make no sense. No disrespect to people with religion and all that. But I'm like, it, 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 you we like following so much. We like following so much. And then we following the wrong thing. But shout out to people like you, because you're not the only one, Don. Uh, I shout out to people like you who are accurate, who freaking went to damn school. Like, damn, you 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 following some yo, I, only only in this country, somebody who dropped out of fucking high school is our hero and shit. Like that don't make no sense. They put a carrot before you, we all gas and we happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that don't make no sense. <laughs> but JT, this is the time that we're living in. And then, and I mean, yo, bro, I don't go to church or nothing like that, but bro, this this is my church. <laughs> 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 this Pocky Watson stuff. Yo, <laughs> yo, you should use this shit for the commercial. <laughs> no cap. Yo, bro, this is my church. Like the brother that said he put it on the tube. You know what I'm saying? And connected to the tube. Me, I put the cigar. I get the the humidifier. 
I get the dry Merlot and just I'm entertained because and I'm not going to lie. I learned a lot, too. I learned about things that I could structure. You know what I'm saying? Take my time on my business because that compounded interest. If you just mind your business, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. It, it works on its own, man. Yeah. Time and patience. That's, yeah. that's, that's all you need, man. Time, yeah. patience and just work. There's, 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 there's value in work. I, I don't get this, this lifestyle of I just want to sit on the beach all day. And oh, there's God. value in work. And if you if you can't find value in work, then I, I feel like your priorities are off. Now, you may be working a job that you don't like. I got that. But you need to find something that you can feel feel like you have some meaning and value. That, that, that's 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 just me. But, bro, listen, I got to let you go because you yeah. shoot my head up. I, I, I'll mess around and, 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 and become <laughs> Hollywood. But I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, you got to have some value in work. Like, I, you can't just give me something. Maybe that's me. You can't just get, if I don't work for it, I don't want it. If you're giving me something, like my wife would tell you, I'm one of the hardest persons to give a gift to. It's just, it is what it is. I, I, I'm a, I'm going to work for mine. It's just what it is. All right. We got Mike Jones in the building. Mike hey, Jones, what's going on? How's it going, JT? Good, man. Thanks for calling. Hey, I just want to say I appreciate your work. And I'm just um, calling in to maybe add some value because I agree with your dialogue and your rhetoric mm -hmm. on a lot of things. I think to answer the question of why I watched this episode was about what an NFT is, right? Okay. So, like, do they have value, right? Mm -hmm. So value to me, right? I think it's just like I used to do multi-level marketing, right? And then one of the things that resonated the most with me is why I got out of it, right? right. I got out of it because at the beginning, they tell you it's a bad idea. They show you the percentage of the numbers of the people who, who actually make money. And it's like 0.0000003. And you have right. to be completely blind or arrogant to believe that you're going to be making money in that system, right? right? So even when it comes to like personal finance and things like that, everyone's binary. It has to be this or that. I think people have to understand that what an NFT is, the value that it gives to you, right, mm -hmm. is that I think blockchain technology, what it solves is record keeping. That's okay. what it's here to solve, right? Okay. I, on the financial side, I don't believe that it's any better on the financial side. What I believe in the technology, and so when it comes to investing in it, like uh, Brother Eli, Common Sense, okay. one of the things that he's really knowledgeable in is understanding the technology and the utility that it serves, right? right. So he's not investing in it like a moon boy who's trying to be a Lambo. He's realizing that for instance, like a non-fungible token, right, is right. something that is not fungible. Like a dollar has four like different nuances on how you can make a dollar. You can do 100 pennies. You can do four quarters, 10 dimes, five nickels. There's more different ways that you can make a dollar. The reason why I say the record keeping is, is what are the things that the government use and everyday people use that you can make non-fungible and have verifiable record keeping that I was the original owner of this item. That's what I believe. Like to answer your question, 95, 95% of them not being valued to bring it back to the network marketing thing. Mm -hmm. Of course it's not. If 95% of them are not worth anything, 95% of them are not worth anything. Like, I don't think that every, like, just because somebody is selling you something doesn't mean it actually has value to the general marketplace. So I think that even when you get like Tory Lanes, right? There's people who think that his music is garbage. So the, the people who want to buy that thing isn't that great anyway. Or like the brother 19 Keys, like or the kangaroo jack tax guy who was like, I'm selling an NFT. Like, why would you want anything from this guy? So you're buying it, expecting to go up in value because. I don't even remember the kangaroo jack tax. I remember the name of his company, but I don't remember like his name or anything like that. So his product has no value to me because he has no brand recognition to me. 
right? Okay. But if you look at things like, um, for instance, a driver's license, um, the deeds to real estate. So think about tokenized assets, right? So when it comes to real estate or anything, right? The paperwork is the real value in real estate, not actually the building. It's who has the title, the deed, and things like that. So if you can show all the people who had it, right, and you wrote the code that manages that, that's where the value is at, in my opinion. All right. I got I got a follow-up question for you because yeah, a, yes, lot of, right. a lot of that I agree with. But here's my follow-up question because the record keeping, the record keeping, that's the one thing that uh somewhat puzzles me, right? All right. Somewhat, somewhat puzzles me because how is the blockchain a better method of record keeping than the methods that we currently have on the books? Um for instance, have you ever like I believe you're in St. Louis and I haven't seen it myself because I'm a real estate investor, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go on to your clerk of courts and you go to look up the deed of a property that was built in like 1956, right? Mm -hmm. And you go to read it because all they're doing is scanning and copying it and putting it on there, right? Like right. it's a service that you'll provide for something that's valuable as a property, which may be historic and maybe the further and further you get and the more you scan it and how well the lighting is, the harder it becomes to read. But if you digitize it and you have actual numbers that put it on it. So if you sold the 1956 home to me and then I sold it to someone else, that instead of having to read a scanned copy of the documents that you may not be able to recognize the person's name, the original address, if you digitize it, it'll be easier to read, is what right. I'm saying. All right. I 1,000% agree with that. But you can do that without the blockchain, correct? I agree with that as well. Right. I can, I can simply take a look at a better copy of the records, not just scan it in, but I can... Mm -hmm manually type in this information so that over time, it's not as if it's fading, right? I'll have the scan copy, but I'd also manually type in that way moving forward, you have the scan copy, but information is still being manually typed in. So I still don't see how the blockchain improves the situation. Another thing that you mentioned yep, that sorry. From what yep. concerns me is that you mentioned a license, a driver's license, right? Yes. Why would I want a driver's license on the blockchain? Why you would want it? Probably anyone, not. When I say when I say me, I mean the average person. G give me give me the, the, the case study as to why the average person would want a driver's license a part of a blockchain. A normal citizen wouldn't. I'm looking in the terms of like selling it to or not selling it like the government using it. Right. Using blockchain technology in general, not just crypto and NFTs. Right. I'm just saying NFTs is a part of the blockchain technology. I don't agree with the whole JPEG art and stuff. I'm talking no. about the actual technology. But here's, yeah. here's my issue. Here's my issue with that. Yeah. The blockchain is public, correct? Yes. All right. So. I would be able to go into this public uh, ledger and through some means, I could probably figure out who's who and what's what. So now I can go to a public, a public ledger and a good enough hacker or a good enough person that has social engineering skills, they'll probably be able to get all my information off my driver's license by going to that public ledger. Absolutely. So, my brother, when you get a, a traffic citation, what's on it? Your driver's license number, right? And that's public information, right? Yeah, my driver's license number, yeah, they could probably fit, find it. On so it app. already is public information. What well, I'm saying is that's not any different. It's not. Well, there, there, there's a few differences there. Okay. Because then they'll be able to take every piece of information that's on my driver's license. Every piece, not just the driver's license number, but they have my full name, my address, every piece of information where they could probably also replicate it, couldn't they? That is all, that's also on your ticket when you get it. I that same thing. 
Like, like I mean, you don't have certain tickets and certain certain things that I see that are blocked out when it comes to the public information on it, right? Um, but once again, I'm looking for the improvement. How is that an improvement? You're saying that's the same as it is now. How is that an improvement? So clerical work, right? So okay. here's so so realistically, so you, there was a couple I of work, people I earlier. My health records, right? My health what, records. My, should that be on the blockchain as well? It's going to be. So, like, uh, like safe? my thing is, I don't think it's safe. What, what I think it is, like, think about this, right? So, this is what I'm saying. I think that we're digitizing everything already. Like, whether you think we walk around with Fitbits, we track our steps, we have this location device in our in our vice that, like, Google Maps can tell you where you're at from global positioning, right? So all of these things, like it sounds right. like it's invasive, but we're already operated underneath it, right? So I'm saying that but I can, the reason why when I the regulation, all those, right? pardon me, I'm sorry. I, I have the option to opt out of those things, correct? A hundred percent, you do, yes. Can I opt out of the blockchain? From, so the blockchain wouldn't be able, just like you said earlier, it's too slow to do global positioning to track you everywhere you go. All no, it is is a paper trail. A do, paper do have, trail. Is if, if I interact with the blockchain, do I have an opportunity to opt out of certain transactions being tracked? Yes, you would. You would have the same protections. How? Because like, so let's say for instance, what, what I'm saying is, is that the privacy that most of us believe that we operate under is a, is a myth, in my opinion. Yeah, but it's that's, like, and, and it, again, that's the current system. What yes. you're saying is, you're saying that this system, oh, well, we already got that with the current system. So well, what I'm, the question I'm asking is, how is it an improvement? So this is where I'm going with the automation side. So just like the self-checkout, right? The self-checkout is an improvement to speed of transactions through someone else, right? I'm saying that as far as the person, when you go to the clerk of court, when you have to wait into those lines, right? All of those services are, could be made up on the blockchain to where you wouldn't have to go into the DMV to update records. And if they encrypt it themselves, right? Because you said the thing about the hacker, right? right. In the blockchain, right? On the current way of doing things, when you change something, you can copy and paste. And unless you can actually get into the code, you wouldn't be able to understand it. But on the blockchain, if you went to scan, if you altered something, it will change the course of that block. So you would know that it was tampered with yeah, but, publicly. But to, to, to go back to that example of like with, with the DMV. Yes. Does the DMV simply have the same system set up with a website that allows you to log in and update your information. And then they have certain tools to verify your information to make sure you're the actual person who has the right to make these updates like uh, verify me or ID me that verifies who you are. So you can go in and make that update on that system. Like th those are they can use the technology that's already in place to do the very same things that you're saying that the blockchain could also do. Yes. So I don't see the improvement. The, the, ver the, the, the more verification of it, what I'm saying is, is the current system is easier to hack and alter than blockchain is. Yeah, but once again, you're talking about the verification. Who's verifying it? The code. Right, the right. Block. But, but isn't when people are verifying the codes, these are like individuals who are doing this, right? People who are uh, not centralized. There's people who are all over the world who are verifying the code who then get rewarded when they're mining to then get more code, right? So, so mining is the DeFi side where you're producing tokens for financial services on transactions, right? Right. The code is deploying smart contracts, which is what Ethereum is doing. So what you would do is write a code that says that gives an if then scenario that deploys it automatically, meaning that you won't need a person. So the service of it, right, would be that the benefit to you and I may not be. But what I'm saying is it's a way to use a computer to replace a human in the job sector is what I'm saying. That's what it's improving upon, in my opinion.
Okay, so the smart with the smart contract, you don't have someone who's actually mining and verifying the transaction on the ledger. The code no. is doing it itself. The code does it itself. It's an if then scenario. If this happens, then this happens, and then it sends you on your way. My the, the code, thing I'm the saying code is verifies that the actual authorized person is doing it. Yes. So are you telling me with Ethereum? Because this happens in Ethereum, correct? Yes, that's uh, this is the largest smart contract platform. Okay. Yes. So with Ethereum, no one's that no one has ever been hacked and lost their Ethereum through a hacker or anything like that. So from from that perspective, mm -hmm. it could be hacked, right? So a hundred percent. If how can it be hacked if the authorized person is not allowing the transaction? I'm sorry. Could you say that again? As a, how is it being hacked if the authorized? I thought it was supposed to authorize, make sure that the authorized person is doing it. That's how so, you verify. Yeah. So deploying the smart contract, right? So let's say that if we, let's go back to the DMV thing, right? So we're going to renew our registrations, right? We okay. go in. You're JT the Pocket Walker. I'm Mike James, right? So then I go in and I was like, I need to renew my registration. They go in, you or you go to your computer, you type it in, right? You, you make and model of your car. That's already on the blockchain. It's already on the DMV. They already have it, right? You go to talk to the person, right. you put your ID in. But the thing is, it's on the blockchain. No one has a face. We're all just numbers, right? Okay. And we have the the seed phrase, right? Then we got this the the private key and the public key, right? So okay. when it comes to your driver's license, that's your public key. In the, in the government sense, your private key would be your social security number that nobody would know, right? So then, so it's the, the, <laughs> A lot of people get got based on their social security number. So let's not be, yeah. Like, the social well, security number is the, is the holy grail of no one knows because people get identity theft all the time. Yeah, so so one, one, of my, one of my things though, I don't like to say, I can't say no one's never done something because no, you can't say that about any situation. Like uh -huh. if no one, I don't like to say never because. But you, you some... haven't heard. You're saying that you haven't heard of anyone losing Ethereum based on being hacked. No, they definitely have. Like I've heard that, right? Oh, but I can't wow. say that it never wow. happened. How? What? How does that happen? So that's irresponsible. So here's the thing, personal finance, right? It's the okay. same thing from investing in the regular traditional way, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of money that I make is different than the amount of money you're with. It's risk management, risk tolerance, right? And then also okay. there's people who cannot manage their own like finances in general. That's why they need a financial advisor. There's some people who don't like, they need someone to step in and take care of that, right? The okay. thing about like, and I don't like talking about the money side of it because that's whenever, like, it's just that if I need, if I know I can handle my own personal assets, I know all the steps that when I go to log something in, like, even when it comes to passwords, and this is something I'll just give for public information, my financial passwords are randomly generated and they're not the same as my email, my social media and stuff like that. Those are two separate things. Some people use one password for everything and that's already a liability, but that's different. Like someone might have their kid's name and all that other stuff. Some people are just easier to hack than other people. The people who are victimized are just not as diligent as other people will be. But Some the, people that's the thing I'm saying, the, the verification. You're saying that the verification on the blockchain, specifically Ethereum, is superior than the system that's already in place, but it sounds as if it's not superior. It's just as weak. In fact, it's weaker because the victim of the fraud has no recourse. That's that's very true. Right. But the, the also the thing is the exposure, right? It's just like, even if you're someone who invests, like you always give this advice, it's just that your exposure to different asset classes, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, so and then like in, in the event, like even people who try to save a million dollars, they put them in four different banks. So they have two hundred and fifty dollars secure. Right. But yeah, seven hundred and fifty thousand, depending on it doesn't matter. The bank, the more the more focus is I have an individual account that's two fifty. 
my wife can have an individual account that's 250 and then we can have a joint account that's 250 to make $750,000. But I, I I get the point that you make. And, and that's a strategy, right? That somebody who's right. more financial savvy would understand, right? And right. that's what I'm saying. Like, there's levels to everything. Like, I can't say that. I, I get your point. But we're yeah. talking about security. There's a difference. Like, the point, the point that I'm trying to make is, okay, let's say you have a person whose username is their email address and their uh, password is their physical address. Yeah. And you have a person who is like a hacker or whatever, and they realize, oh, this guy's username at his bank is his email. He sent me an email, I know. And then his address, let me try his address as his password because he has his address in his email as well. Oh, now that I'm in his bank account, I'm going to then transfer $100,000 from his account to my account. Okay, bet. That person, even though they were very negligent in their personal security of the password to their banking account and the username to their banking account, the bank it will still be able to recover those funds. While on the other side, if they do the identical thing with Ethereum, with any uh, cryptocurrency, there's no recourse. Right. And so that's why I don't think it's superior. And then so superiority, like so so that's you know, like maybe if I couldn't say superior because it depends on the perspective, but also mm -hmm. to ask a question that you asked is are you saying that everyone who's ever got frauded and lost money has always gotten it back? Absolutely not. Uh, see, and that's what I'm saying. Like, like if you can't ever say always and never, right. and then like and yeah. use that as the benchmark for superiority. No, it's and, like, and, and, right, listen, I got it. The point, the point, and thank you for the call. The point that I'm making is we're we're doing it based off percentages, right? So if you look at a percentage of okay, 75% of the people who get defrauded in the current system, they actually get their money back, but 25% lose it. But if we look at the other system, it's like three or five percent get their money back in this system and 95 percent of them lose their money due to fraud you can't equate the two both aren't perfect but one is clearly superior and if i'm trying to uh replace the current system with a new system it should be equal or better it shouldn't be worse I think that's the point that I was trying to get to. All right, we got three more callers, and we're gonna wrap this up. We got Lanes, Blake, and Byron. So Lanes, you're you're in the building. What's going on? What's good, brother JT? Yes, sir. Me? Yeah, go right ahead. All right. First off, I like to say, man, I've been following you since like 30k followers, and you are <laughs> undoubtedly my OG in the world of trash fire. But <laughs> when it comes to Web3, as the first founder of a Black-owned NFT registry coming soon, we are Dropco. Check us out on Twitter, D R O P K O. I got a G check on a couple things, brother JT. Hey, listen, like I'm not I'm not the expert. I'm just a guy asking questions. I'm a financial advisor asking questions. And I respect What's going on? it. I respect your fiduciary ability. Yeah. But uh, first off, Educate. I like to respond to some uh, some of the things that your caller said. Okay. Like one brother said. Um, that it took years for there to be a use case for cryptocurrency, which inherently wasn't true because from the minute that Satoshi Nakamoto first published, uh, well, not from the minute, but from the minute that Bitcoin first went live, like almost the next day, mm -hmm. immediately you saw use cases in the dark web and, you know, the more seedier parts of the Internet. So, you know, immediately there was a use case there. Now, there's some. OK, there's OK. Some All right, tell on, tell on. Let's pause right there. Let's pause right there. This is a great point. Pause right there. So what you're saying it. is immediately there was a use case for cryptocurrency, meaning that there was a clear defined problem that the current system was not adequately solving, where when Bitcoin came in, immediately Bitcoin solved that problem better than the current system. And the problem exactly. that you are using as an example is crime. Fraudulent stuff, being able to. I'm not saying it was the best use case, but it was a use case. <laughs> Why? I'm advocating crime. Immediately but... to be able to transact and buy illicit drugs over the internet in an anonymous way. Hey, it had the first bankers was robbing people too. I'm just saying, you know, financial instruments get used for 
for bad uses all the time. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just making what, the point. What, what was the example you just used? I was laughing too hard. What was that example? Um, weren't the first bankers also known as the first robber ba- barons? You know, the first people to just legally rob people blind? You know what I'm saying? Like financial instruments, whether you're talking oh, about the Bernie Madoff, was, Jordan Belfort. The, the financial instrument of Federal Reserve notes was not the cause of that. They didn't say, oh, great, now I have Federal Reserve notes, and now I have a solution to the problem that I have of being able to buy and sell illicit drugs or to commit crimes. That wasn't the or, that wasn't the, 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 the number one uh, uh, use of a Federal Reserve note. Okay, but equally, Bitcoin wasn't the cause of people using no, no, no. It was, the, it was the to commit crime. What you're saying is it was the solution. How was a Federal Reserve note the solution to uh, commit a crime or to transact in illegal ways that wasn't available before? Oh, uh, well, now you don't have to barter to steal from people. Now you can just say, well, here's a currency note. And then, um, boom. Now, it's, it's, it's a weak example. Okay, uh, touche. We'll, okay, we'll call it I on would that. agree we'll that's a weak that example. One. Let's move to the next point. But next point, uh, yeah. as far as use cases go, like, for instance, as a, as a black business person, you know, there's a huge disparity in the amount of capital available to black founders, right? You know, okay. I think they say the average white founder can get around 23, 30,000 in a friends and family round, right? But the average okay. black founder, if we can raise any money, we might raise like a thousand, two thousand dollars. Now, we have reached a point in maturity in blockchain technology where you can have decentralized venture capital. Like for instance, there's the Cult DAO protocol, which since going live last year has already funded three million dollars in uh in projects. Now they only fund up to thirteen ETH, which was at its height around fifty thousand dollars per project. Right now that's around twenty one thousand dollars ish. But I'm saying that's an option that's available to me, you, any of the listeners, brothers in Nigeria, brothers in Ghana. And that mm-hmm. is a viable way to replace a friends and family round. And there's no centralized heads at it. I mean, there's a form of democracy going on, but ultimately you are asking the community for this 13th. You're asking the community for investment in your project. Okay. And I don't, let's 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 uh, talk about that real quick. OK. So the 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 case study and the point that you're making, which I agree with 50 percent, you're saying that obviously based on just the reality of the financial situation of certain communities, if a, a Caucasian founder of a startup is attempting to raise money among the first people who you normally raise money with, friends and family. Versus uh-huh. a black person, same startup idea, who attempts to go to their friends and family to raise money. Obviously, most likely, just based on the numbers, that white startup uh, owner or founder would have access to more capital based on the realities of wealth in their community versus the realities of the lack of wealth in our community. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. How That's does a decentralization blockchain, of opportunity? Okay, okay. How how does blockchain or cryptocurrency solve that problem? Well, in the case of Cult DAO, this is something all done on smart contracts. It's built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a kind of complex tokenomics model where they have their own token, and from every mm-hmm. use of that token, a little bit is sent to a treasury, and mm-hmm. then from there they finance projects. All right, but let's, it, let's, let's pause right there because I, I I I don't think you're you're focused on the question. How does blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, whatever, how does that solve the problem of the friends and family fundraising? Because it doesn't matter if you're using Federal Reserve notes or tokens, cryptocurrency, whatever. The reality of the financial situation of the friends and family in the Caucasian community or in the black community still did not change. So how does that solve that problem? It solves that problem because we know that most VC capital does not go to black founders in any round. Well, hold on, slow down, slow down. 
you're, 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 you're moving the goalposts. We were talking okay. about friends and family, right? That That's the example you gave. I wrote it down. That friends is true, but to get so to VC Capital, you have to so get past the friends going, and family, if right? I am, if I'm Jake Thornton, if, I, if I'm not Jason Thornton <laughs> or why, I'm Jake Thornton, and I'm, I'm Caucasian, and I go to my friends and family with my startup idea to raise money versus Jamal Thornton, who goes to his friends and family, how does the difference between a system of Federal Reserve notes versus a system of cryptocurrency, how does that improve Jamal's situation by going to, as you put it, friends and family? How does that improve him? Can you name an equivalent to the system that I just gave you in the world of traditional finance? We, what are you talking? We, we, we just said. No, but I'm asking you. We got. No, I'm friends. asking you. Like, yeah, we, we have friends and family that we're attempting to raise. Because remember, this is the problem that you said that the cryptocurrency or whatever was was solving. If okay. I go to my friends and family and all they have is Federal Reserve notes versus going to my friends and family and they have crypto. How is that? How do I get more money out of them simply because they no longer have Federal Reserve notes or they have Federal Reserve notes, but they also have the option to convert those Federal Reserve notes into cryptocurrency? How do I raise more money? OK, now you slightly shifted the goalposts a little bit there, but no, there actually you, you is a blockchain based family. solution to that. You because... said friends and family. Yeah, but what I'm saying is when you're raising through cult DAO, you're not raising through friends and family. It's an oh, alternative to friends and family. It is an alternative that to friends and family round that's built on the blockchain. That, but the, the point that I'm making is you did not improve the situation for African-American founders because now everyone is still open to that new system. You did not improve the situation. But if the system open to African-American founders that through the series of nepotism and just a lack of access to opportunity, we generally don't have. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned how can you uh, make those dollars, give give those dollars more bang for your buck. And there actually are blockchain based solutions that solve that problem as well in the sense of uh, there's something called quadratic funding in, um, in cryptocurrency, which basically means that when somebody like let's say you have a GoFundMe to start pocket watch with JT over again, you want ten thousand dollars. Okay. And you get 10,000 individuals to give you a dollar. Okay. Now, with the system of quadratic funding, you could have people who match that money in the sense that it could be any foundation, any whale, anybody with a bunch of money. And right. the more people that donate to your fundraiser, mm -hmm. the more people, I mean, the more money you draw from that, that, uh, that matching pool. Right. Which in a sense, like, like let's say you raise $10,000 from 10,000 people. They all right. give a dollar. You would right. receive more of that matching pool than a white guy who just had two super rich family members and they both donated five thousand dollars. OK, so, but um, how how is how is that different from a current system with just using fiat money, just using Federal Reserve? Because I've never heard of any crowdfunding that does crowd quadratic funding in the world of trad fire. I don't even know if it's possible yeah, I'm saying, of being what, built on the blockchain. What, what do you mean? I mean. How is that not possible to use with Federal Reserve notes? Um, you know, maybe theoretically it would be possible, but I have never you seen an example of it. You're, if you're telling me, here's the system. We have a pool of money. If you can bring, based on the matching of the participants who give, you get X amount of the pooled money. Exactly. Right, you can do that with cash, right? But well, can you name an example that does it? But I'm saying it's not improving the system. You're but making is that not like an improved system? system? Is improved. You can do it with cash. And with cash, this system is improved because I'm not in a situation where I then have to convert my cash into a cryptocurrency and then do it. I can just go from cash to cash. Well, if you were to do that, you would have to convert your physical fiat money into digital fiat money. Because the only way I can see a system like that working in the traditional world of finance, it would have to be internet based. And then anything on the internet, yeah. cryptocurrency the, is inherently so, a, so, a so better let's say system. I got a startup, right? I got a startup. I want to start a plumbing company, 
right? And I do this, right? Mm -hmm. Can I then go to the plumbing supply store and buy my supplies with the money that I got from this system without converting to Federal Reserve notes? If you are an American, yes, because we have a bunch of different options available to us. You have Coinbase card, Crypto.com card. But I'm have, converting Mexican, it. Mexpay. I'm, when, I, when you swipe the card, you're literally converting it to cash because the, the store is not technically accepting the cryptocurrency. They're accepting the cash. Correct. Okay. Well, this is that's that's very true. But okay. let's say you have okay. an American Express so, card. Okay. Can you so spend then, an American so Express then, card? Well, anywhere? And then here's the difference. What if in the morning, this particular coin was worth a dollar per coin, but then by the time I get to the store and I swipe, is worth seventy five cents a coin. What happens? That is me? where stable coins come in handy. Like okay. uh, you're not supposed to. Like there are coins that are better in speculation, like you have Ethereum, right. you have Chia, you have Bitcoin, that the value really comes in the ability to speculate on those tokens. But there are existing reserve tokens like you have OM from Olympus Dow, you have a litany of stable coins, you have yes. Canadian dollar stable coins, Australian dollars, US dollars, okay. um, Hong and Kong with, dollars. And, with and they that, have they, held with their that value. Stable coin. So, so with that stable coin, even when I transact between that stable coin and fiat or any other any other type of uh cryptocurrency that transaction is a taxable event correct depending on your country yes it would be well in the u.s let's just let's just bank on the fact that we're talking about the united states of america would it be in the u.s okay in the u.s i will give you that but that is a problem of legislation not necessarily a problem of the blockchain itself why, why, why would that be a problem? I mean, that, like, just, just think about this. It's not real currency. So it I mean, can't be treated as a dollar hasn't been backed currency. since. Huh? Our code since when? Our dollar hasn't been backed by anything real since what? The 70s, 60s? So no, what the, makes the, the American the dollar point, more no, 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 real no, no, no. for? The point, the point that I'm making is it's not real currency in the sense. Oh, like tangible, it. like touchable. No, 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 no. Not even the yeah. tangibleness of it. I'm saying it's not real currency because it's, it is not established that you have to accept this for payment anywhere you go in the united states of america they cannot refuse your transaction in u.s currency they have to accept it in u.s currency are you aware of that that is a fair argument and that would be more of an adoption issue than a blockchain issue right. it's like well we're, ta we're talking like about the, the status that it is right now but I would like to make the parallel okay. of blockchain in 2023 to the Internet in 1999 when the bubble burst originally. And everybody was like, oh, the Internet's just a Ponzi scheme. It has no real use cases. It's just a bunch of nerds being no, nerds man, on the man, web. Listen, listen. I'm, 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 40, I'm 40 years old. I was around during that time. OK, uh -huh. people were not saying that the Internet itself, what they were complaining about was the businesses because the internet wasn't a flop the flop was you had businesses that jumped on the wave and they would just add dot com dot to the com. back of their name mm -hmm. and they had a bunch of useful idiots who saw this this is an internet company and i'm going to put money into it i'm going to invest in this company because i heard that internet stuff is popular okay when it okay. comes to cryptocurrency and stuff like that, you once again, you have a bunch of coins that have absolutely no utility. You have a bunch of people starting whoa, whoa, whoa. coins with the concept of they only are doing it for the pump and dump. And because there's That's no true. regulation, there are a lot of people who are being financially hurt by it. That is true. It is an unregulated market and... Those are some of the cons to operating in an unregulated market. And I will give you that. It's it's the Wild West in the world of cryptocurrency right now. But to say that no coin, no token has inherent utility is a little bit misunderstanding yeah, of how the technology I works. That. I don't think I ever said that. The point that I was making is I don't see the use that is currently a solution better than what's already in place. Oh, well, let's get to that because... 
Please. That's actually the core of your conversation. Right. There's four key Here, Here's the last point. Let's hear this. I want to I want to hear how it does it improve the uh the problem better than what we currently have. Okay, specifically in the world of NFTs because that's what the conversation is about. Gotcha. There are four key pillars of this. Okay. One, verifiability like the last caller talked about. Two, decentralization. Three, new methods of monetization that would be traditionally incredibly difficult to do in the world of TradFi or impossible and for the separation of state and currency from each other. Okay, let's go over one, verifiability in mm -hmm. terms of NFT. How mm -hmm. many people in history have bought a forged or counterfeited piece of art? A forged many. Van Gogh, a forged Picasso, many. a forged many. Basquiat? Many. Now, it is factually impossible unless you are operating at a high level of negligence to buy a forged piece of blockchain art. Because why? Mm -hmm. It is publicly available where that deployer contract came from. You can see that Van Gogh published this smart contract and this contract mm -hmm. is associated with X NFT. So that is publicly available. It doesn't take okay. an appraiser. It that, doesn't take that, any great, this level is, of skill. Great point. But here, here's where here's where the logic does not meet reality. There are people who accidentally bought fake board apes and stuff like that because of their negligence, negligence and not knowing how to verify that they were actually getting the real board ape. Okay, and that happens, but I mean that's the problem of, of negligence in general. Because and you I as agree. a financial here's expert, you know here's where your problem is. That's not an improvement on the current system. It has it the is same an improvement. failings as the current system. It is an improvement because How it is, is a an superior system than appraiser. An appraiser can be fooled. An appraiser can be conned. An appraiser can be paid off. The blockchain can't be paid off. The user himself mm -hmm. might be negligent, but you can't change the actual verifiability of that piece of NFT artwork. Or it doesn't have to always be artwork because NFTs mm -hmm. can be multiple things. And that's what I'm again, saying that you still have when you talk about verifiability and security, you still have people who are get like uh hacked and they lose their NFT. Okay. How is that houses get broken into? And what I'm saying there, that is right. actually also solvable. That is right. also solvable here's, because here's, there can be code implemented directly into your smart contract mm -hmm. that blacklists the transfer. And that blacklist the wallet from moving. Let's say somebody hacked you or fished your account or something right. happened where you lost the ownership of your NFT. That can be decoded directly into the smart contract. The, same way, the, the same way that you can add security to the physical art, correct? But that security can be removed. You can never change a smart contract once it's been published. Okay. It's like those, those things that uh, the stores put on... Um, like electronics and clothes and stuff, that mm -hmm. is an anti-theft prevention measure. But that thieves figure that out immediately. They cut them off, they burn them off, they do what they have to do to remove that. And I'm saying, what you're but operating you're saying, that you're level saying with of the smart, You're saying with the smart contract, no one's ever lost or been uh, defrauded out of their NFTs. I'm not saying, because the smart contract is a broad term. And there can be ears in the smart contract. It goes to another issue because generally if you lose your money, if you lose your NFTs in the world of uh, Web3, there's two things that happen. Either A, a situation was socially engineered where you were fished into clicking a giving transaction them, giving, or signing giving a transaction. Giving people the information that they needed to be able to defraud you. Exactly. You clicked yeah. the wrong link and then you gave somebody a, a permission. The, but that's the, also the same, the same thing that happens in the current system. But that's also something that wouldn't happen if you were using a hardware wallet. Like you can't give somebody permission to take something. Right. That's and not the, same, the same way that you can uh, install certain software and things that will blacklist or throw in the junk mail that bad email. Correct. But you can't do that for your RP. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So now we're switching back to the RV. The same thing where you can have certain security at your home, right? To verify, you know, security guards, whatever you you would have at your home, to make it harder for someone to break into your home and steal your art. And then once that again, now you have to have error. once again, now you have to have some kind of black market to then sell 
the the artwork, right? And yes, and then that's true. and then the person who buys the artwork. Now I have the artwork, and I announce to the world. Now I now own the artwork. Isn't it easy then to trace back and say, "Hey, you now own the artwork. It was stolen from me. Who did you get it from? You can track that down, correct?" On the blockchain? No, no, no. I'm talking about in real life. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Because yes, there's a lot of art. Yes. That's Most exactly of the time, I would say yes. I'm trying to hear where it's you have a system that improves on the current one, not one that's parallel. But I gave you how it's an objectively better system because you're talking way about how you can add error. The point that you're making is that there's different things that you can add to it to make it more uh, secure. And I'm saying, well, there's different things that you can add to this system to make it more secure. And we, you still can't try to compare a digital form of art to a physical form of art. You can still have a digital form of art that has absolutely nothing to do with the blockchain, correct? You could, but it would be inferior in terms of verification of the creator of that art and who is the owner of that art. Because owning a JPEG is very different than owning an on-chain mm -hmm. piece of art that is directly linked mm -hmm. to a smart contract that says, this smart contract was minted by Van Gogh and bought by Pocket Watch from a JT. I'm right. saying the level of the yeah, open ledger and, and, and what Okay, and, and, and in, in what case study and what reality has a digital form of art has that type of value? Um, I believe a piece sold for $39 million at the end of last year. I forget the name of it. And There's that's, been that's, a lot that's, of seven, eight. That, that's less sales. than what a what a number one uh, X Men comic book would be. Okay, but X Men comic books have been around since when? The yeah, 50s, that's, that's 40s. right. And and one is one is digital and repeatable, and one actually has tangible value based on the fact that it was actually printed and made and was in circulation. You're talking about digital art. So if Starry Nights was made on a computer and minted as a blockchain, you're saying that inherently it would have less value than the if an artist painted it physically. Because that's a subjective standpoint. Yeah, it, I'd, I'd say yes, it would. It had less value. Okay, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a little bit subjective there because, you know, a digital artist is still an artist. It is what art. Is, it's um, absolutely art. But I'm saying it has less value than a handmade piece of art one of a kind physical that the person actually touched because you're, you're you're not technically getting like if, if i'm throwing the code from me to you like okay if i if i took a picture of something and i text it to you right, right. are you actually getting the real picture or are you getting a copy of the picture no but if a smart contract ledger that can be accessed by anybody says that I, Land, am the owner of that original picture, then yes, original I picture. am the owner of that picture and it can be verified mm -hmm. by anybody. Right. And what's the value of ownership of something that's infinitely uh, duplicated? I mean, how many duplicates are there of Starry Night? Or right. Basquiat's work, I'm saying. No, no, no. Anything There's can no be real. duplicated. No, no, no. We're talking about something that's inherently always digital, never physical. But that's what I'm saying. Even physical art can be duplicated. I'm saying yeah, like but no, no. art forgery. I'm talking about inherently advanced. digital. Something that's inherently always digital. That can always that that never had physical form. What's the inherent value of the original versus the copy? It's the same inherent value that a music song that you like that you only hear through an MP3 that you never physically touch. It has that artistic subjective value to you. The but the different you the listener or you the viewer. But my All copy is subjective. My copy of the song, what's the difference between my copy of the song that's on my phone versus the copy of the song that's on your phone? Now that you're kind of it's kind of a gray area because music NFTs is a little bit different than uh, the way well, you brought yeah, bro, you brought up the music. I wasn't talking about music. You brought up the but music. But I use music as an example because it's another and I think form it was a of bad art that never has tangible. My copy value. of the song and your copy of the song is absolutely uh 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 fungible. It's the same freaking thing. Okay, so if you had ten prints of Van Gogh's Starry Night, they're all exactly identical. They were mm -hmm. all printed from the same place, all have the same frame. Right. What is the inherent value of those then? 
Absolutely I'm none. Saying. Absolutely none. Because you're and that's you're comparing you're comparing right. reprints to reprints, but you're neglecting the actual directly copy from the artist that he created. But that's what I'm saying. Like, if you, as an artist, were to reprint, those reprints directly from you as an artist will have more value than some guy 100, 300 years later who just decided, look, I want to reprint this art piece. So if yeah, you wanted to release possibly, that... You would... But the, the original one would always have more value. The reprints would have less, correct? And it's the same thing with blockchain-based art because... And the appraisal of art is always a subjective subject matter because okay, I mean it, it, it's it's that's neither here I, nor well, there. I mean, it, 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 like we're just talking about the very. It was trying to focus on this point of talking about verifying. <laughs> it's, it's, verifying is better, and I don't think you really made a strong enough point of how how the digital blockchain and being able to verify the ownership how that's better and this superior than the current system. I. Because it cuts out the yeah. human error of having an appraiser. It cuts out the human error of having security to protect your artwork. It cuts out the human errors what, what, that what, are what, all what, inherent. Let's let's keep it real. Let's keep it a honey. Let's keep it a honey. Let's not act as if the black community is in a dire need of their artwork being verified. Right? Let's not act as if, oh, this this right here, being able to verify our artwork is the thing that's been holding us back as a community. I don't see this as any type of solution to a problem that we currently have. Okay, now if you're talking about just the black community, or any, a couple any examples community. I could give. In any community. What are, what are we well, looking for? The art community would extremely be, they would, they would definitely agree with that because that is a huge problem. Art fraud is a huge problem in the world of art. So um, I think okay. the art community would 100% disagree with that one. Okay. But as a black community, I will say, OK, art is not our greatest issue right now financially. Like if every black artist were to be able to monetize their work, that would be great. And that is another great. What's point keeping them from monetizing life. their work now? I don't think I don't think you, you understand my point of view. I'm not saying I'm not saying that it has absolutely no ability that maybe somewhere in the future it, it can solve a problem that we currently can't find. But you're making it sound as if they cannot monetize their art now. What is stopping them from monetizing their art now? Logistics, usually, like I'm saying, with a physical piece of art, for one. No, we're not talking about physical. We're talking about digital. We're talking about digital. What's okay, stopping well, them from digital. monetizing their, their digital art right now without the blockchain? Okay, so let's go regular digital, and we'll go over to the world of music NFT. Now let's just, around. Keep, let's just keep it with the art. What's stopping them from monetizing their art now without the blockchain? As far as physical or digital or both? Digital. There's not really a good option to do that. Like I'm saying, you have websites like Flickr and DeviantArt where you can show your artwork but I'm saying is that really falls prey to the problem of somebody just being able to right click and save your artwork. There's no reason to inherently buy that, that because there's the no on chain. What, what are we talking, bro? I, listen, but what I'm, I'm saying I'm, is I'm you right they can right click the NFT, correct? But they will never be the owner on chain of that piece of art. There Clearly is nothing the person, that they can do, my, bro. There's nothing the part, that they can do. So you're telling me, you're telling me, the person who can right click on Flickr, all of a sudden, because it's on the blockchain, now they care about ownership and having a receipt. Yeah, yeah, of course. They but didn't what, care when it- <laughs> I'm not saying that they care as individuals. I'm saying that it inherently gives it a level of value because now you can say without a doubt that this artwork is original and you are the owner of it. But and I'm saying that didn't... gives you a level of, of verifiable I, 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 ownership I, I, that doesn't exist without blockchain technology. There is no equivalent without the blockchain. There is no the equivalent without okay. Uh, okay. technology. Uh, uh, okay, bro, 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 uh, okay, okay, okay. Listen, listen. I just I, I don't think you're hearing me. The person who right clicked in the traditional art gallery 
online. They don't give a damn about the blockchain. If they were going to right click in the traditional online art gallery, they're going to right click with the blockchain. That's not an improvement. I'm just looking for the improvement. That's all. We got two more callers and then I got to go to bed. All right, we got Blake. Blake, you're live on the air. What's going on? Whoa, you getting me, JT? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. You getting me? Mm -hmm. All right. What's up, King? <laughs> okay. King. I've, been, listen, <laughs> I've been, I've been, hey. I've been on YouTube for too long. When I when I hear someone call me King, I start patting for my wallet. Hey, Go right hey, here. Hey, I was just gonna say, don't reach for your wallet, man. Don't reach for your wallet, man. I've been watching you since uh 2020. Um, when you was covering the PPP stuff, man. I I, mean, I, I come on here. I, I'm just a a non CEO truck driver. I drive for a company. That's it. Uh, I'm one of the broke people, and in, 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 if you leave it up to Jay Morrison, though. <laughs> but uh, man, shout out to uh, you. Um, man, I can't even think of his name now. Uh, Orlando. Uh, man, y'all, y'all still having me laughing, man. Oh yeah, and uh, some people I've been watching ever since um. Since uh, Miss Pocket Watch was telling me stop cutting people off, so yeah, man, I'm still I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that. <laughs> nah, you, nah, you way better because uh, you let people just ramble on for days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, All right, man, what's man. going on? What, 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 what do you think about NFTs? What, what, what NFTs a scam? Or am I missing it? Uh, what, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, I think NFTs, um, they not worth more than the V bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And, and, Man. and here's the problem I understand when people are calling in to defend the technology based on the promise that the technology will be something one day. Right, I get it. One day there's going to be a situation where it's viable, it makes sense, it's an improvement on the current system. One day, the point that I'm making it's not today. The point that I'm also making is there's many people who are using this technology to defraud people based on the fact that they think. This is a good investment. And as of right now, it's not a good investment. People who do not have the financial resources to invest in a speculative asset class, which over 90% of the population, I feel like, is in that boat, they should not be investing in it. And I think we need to be extremely careful in the way that we promote these things, especially when it comes to celebrities and influencers because they are doing a lot of financial harm to their own fans and you know it pisses me off basically yeah. that's what we're yeah. yeah one day it's gonna be flying cars too <laughs> see and even that even that i i, I kind of i kind of scratch my head on the flying cars because i grew up with back to the future and my older brother told me, he said, hey, you know, JT, when by the time you drive, there's going to be flying cars. And I believed that for a long time. And then I thought to myself, Negroes can barely drive safe on the street. Imagine a Negro doing donuts in the sky and they fall on somebody's house. I don't believe there will ever be flying cars unless there's some sort of system where it's AI controlled because if you just allow any old body the ability to get into a vehicle and it go off into the sky and I, I just don't the technology is there I just don't see it actually happening based on the harm that it will cause and that's why I bring it back to the NFTs yeah the technology is there but the harm is too great yeah, there could be a many people who will be reasonable and they'll, you know, drive or fly their car safely. 
but the vast majority will end up hurting more than the people who they're already hurting on the road. They'll get into crashes and then it falls to the, to the ground. Like it's just, it's impractical to me. It's, it's, it's impractical, but maybe I'm missing something. All right, all right. He, he he dropped. I didn't kick him out. He dropped. So uh, let me bring up Byron. Oh, well, I can't bring up Byron. Let me see. We got Blake back. Blake, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. My bad. Right. That was me. All right. So so what's your final words? Because I can't bring up Byron because he he's he's glitching. What's your final words on NFTs? The 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 usage. Obviously, they uh, researchers said ninety five percent of all NFTs are worthless. You're talking about millions upon millions of dollars that just went away in value. And most of these people who, what I'm seeing, they were everyday average people jumping on a trend, thinking that they were gonna make money, not thinking that they they love the art, because that's the problem. Let's not act as if most of the people who invested in these NFTs they were buying them for the art. They weren't buying it because they thought the art was nice. They bought it because they thought it was going to be worth money. That's the problem. All right. Uh, my final words, I, I can't even lie. I don't have no final words to, <laughs> on NFT because I don't know anything about it. And uh, <laughs> But, uh, man, if people keep putting their money in there, they're going to get jacked because people going to come in and they're going to grip them. Cause um the, the lions don't teach the antelope how to get away. <laughs> they gonna get they gonna get got. <laughs> always, always. Thank you, Blake. I appreciate it. Listen, I don't. I have no idea why y'all stayed on for three freaking hours. I got caught up in conversations like we were just sitting in front of each other. Some of these callers, and we went way too long. But I do want to make a point. There's a particular pocket watcher who has been asking for more money taxes or more money taxes. It's been a long time since I made this, uh, did this video. So I'm going to go out with this video of Mo Money Taxes. Y'all have a great weekend. Hi, I'm Mike Evans with Mo Money. Tell me, what do you know about Mo Money? Brother, all I know is I was there last night getting my taxes done. And today, there's Mo Money all the way. You know what I'm saying? And how about you? In here yesterday, back today to get my check. This Mo Money stuff is real. I'm Mo Money for life. I the slow money? Well, come to Mo Money, because we about that. Mo Money Taxes, and once again, it's on, and I got the hookup. <laughs> Mo Money Taxes, come down and see us, and you'll be glad that you did. At Mo Money Taxes, you're more than just another number. This year, we're offering our 30 second refunds to go along with our next day refunds. Come down and see us, and you'll be glad that you did. Continuing saga of Mo Money Taxes. Norfolk police are investigating the tax preparer, and they have alerted the IRS about customers' complaints. Where's my check? That's the question all of these people want answered. The IRS is basically verifying to us that their, our money is here in their bank account. Friday, crowds gathered at Mo Money Taxes in Norfolk. On Granby Street, owner Mario Brady told us he printed 50 checks and 30 did not clear. The banks have refused to cash their checks saying that there is fake. I mean, that is unacceptable. Federal agents raided the headquarters of Mo Money Taxes in Tennessee this morning. You may remember, Ted, on your side, I traveled to Memphis for local Mo Money customers who claimed they didn't receive their refund. We continue to follow another developing story. New tonight, tensions continue to run high as customers wait for their tax returns that they say were not getting from Mo Money taxes. You can see the level of anger just a few hours ago at this Norfolk location off Brambleton. Angry customers who say they were promised refund checks and didn't get them broke windows and police were called to break up the angry crowd. That's just ridiculous. Marcus Eves, a former customer who says he filed his taxes with Mo Money in 2007, is worried about what we recently uncovered behind this Mo Money Tax Services location on Elvis Presley. This is wrong for, you know, files to be out here. This is people's personal information that anybody could have come by and gotten. Investigators are now looking into the discovery of thousands of documents thrown into three dumpsters behind the facility. Shortly after authorities arrived on scene and put up crime scene tape, so did Marky Granberry with Mo Money Taxes. Normally, uh, we would have all files shredded uh, and, and uh, 
shredded or whatever, but this we don't throw files in the garbage can. I asked him what happened and why the documents were not shredded. Our lease was up on this operation, so I assume the landlord went inside of the location and for whatever reason he decided to throw the files in a dumpster. You have some. You'll have some at noon once. Give us some regular. George, you got one second? I just want to ask you a question. We're doing a story on tax collect I'm collecting overdue bills for the city. Uh, you notice the number of council when haven't paid their water or sewer bills yet. Cash flow problem. Is that why you haven't paid yours? I didn't know it wasn't paid, but this. Well, it's about, about a year since you paid a water or a sewer bill. According to this, it's almost $500. Long way from 2000 I would at one time. So you say you are paying off your bill? No, I didn't say that. But it says here you haven't paid your bill in a year. That's what you said. I'm not aware of that. No big problem, you know. The city ain't going to go bankrupt. Well, don't you think it's a bad example to set? No, I do not. I don't have the money. You don't have money to pay a $400 water bill? I do not have the money, okay? Did you hear me? Well, in the time of austerity, Wait, just don't you think it's said? How much you owe? We owe $440. I do not have the money. You say you don't have money to pay your bill? Did you hear me? But your water, your, your water's still on, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, should, don't you think your water should be turned off if you're not paying your no, bill? No, it should not be. You know, you know one of these days, you're going to corner me, and I'm going to kick your ass. Okay? And one of the days, you're going to corner me, and I'm going to kick your ass. Well, don't you think that's a legitimate question, George? I mean, you're not the and only I counselor. gave you're you. The only wait a minute. I gave you an legitimate answer. You asked me about my water bill. What did I tell you? Said so you didn't have the money. But your water's still on, isn't it? Now that was uh, my fucking answer to you. But I don't think everybody has that luxury of uh, having their water tough shit. Things. Okay, now one of these days you're gonna corner me and I'm gonna kick your ass. Now keep keep fucking with me, okay? Now I'm telling you, keep fucking with me. Now, one of these days you're going to grab me the wrong fucking minute. Now, I gave you my fucking answer, okay? Okay. We gotta now, I ain't bullshitting with you. We got to meet. Now, you scared him, but I'll kick your goddamn ass, boy. I ain't bullshitting with you. Son of a bitch. Now, you hang around with me if you want. Now, you think I'm bullshitting with you.